Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Council Member Gatewood? Here. Council Member Sander? Here. Council Member McGarvey? Here. Vice Mayor Budge? Here. Mayor Terry? Here. Uh, the clerk, please read the television announcement. The meeting of the Rancho Cordova City Council will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will air Wednesday, November 22nd at 6 p.m. and Thursday, November 23rd at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. A DVD copy is available for checkout from any library branch. A copy can also be ordered from the city clerk's department, and a webcast of this meeting will also be available on the city's website within 48 hours of adjournment of this meeting. Thank you. So with that, we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance, which tonight will be led by Joshua Wood. Um, Following that, uh, we will have uh, Michael Hughes from United, United Methodist Church here to uh, give us our invocation. Mayor, Councilman, uh, audience, please bow our heads. Lord, with Thanksgiving coming, we give thanks for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. Watch over our military and be with all of those that can't be home for the holidays and watch all of our homeless that are hurting during the holiday seasons. Dear Lord, as we gather for this meeting, give us the use of our gift of peace and understanding that we may approach the matters that we must handle with sincere and just hearts. May you watch over and guide our tongues, that we may not hurt our friends with whom we work for the betterment of our community. Keep us always true to the principles on which this city was founded. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. So we'll move on to presentations. Uh, first up, we have Kim Duran, um, Administrative Services Director, to introduce a new employee, who I already met. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. I'd like to introduce Rod Van Buskirk. He is the city's new business systems analyst. He comes to the city with over 30 years of experience in the IT industry, and he worked for over 20 years for Weston Consulting here in Rancho Cordova, um, basically as a consultant implementing business applications to municipalities all over the United States. So we're really excited to have him on board to assist us as we endeavor to start updating our IT systems. Yeah, I thank you. Uh, for, I'm very excited to be here at this uh, time in the city's uh, life and uh, looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Very good. Welcome. Welcome, yes. Thanks. Next, I'll, uh, I'd like to invite up Elizabeth Sparkman, uh, Interim Community Development Director, to introduce another new employee. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I'm pleased to introduce Darcy Goulart. Darcy's with Michael Baker. She's been the, she's been a high level planner um, for about 18 years of experience. Most recently, she's been with she's been here in City Hall since about August, serving as our planning manager. Most recently, coming from the city of Elk Grove, and this, here's Darcy to say a few words. Good evening. Um, I have corresponded with a few of you or met some of you in the past few weeks. I'm happy to be here, looking forward to working on a lot of different uh, projects and assignments. And so thank you for the welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's two. All right. <laughs> and We're next, I'll here. invite up Diane Rogers, our present CEO of our Ranch Cordova Chamber of Commerce, for our proclamation.
Diane got roped into this one. This was my idea, actually. Um, so we have a proclamation here um, giving recognition of Small Business Saturday, which is November 25th. So I'll go ahead and read it. So the city of Ranch Cordova celebrates our small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community. According to the United States Small Business Administration, there are currently 28.8 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all businesses with employees in the United States and are responsible for 63% of the net new jobs created over the past 20 years. Small businesses employ 48% of the employees in the private sector in the United States. 91% of all consumers believe that supporting small businesses, independently owned restaurants and bars is important. 76% of all consumers plan to go to one or more small businesses as part of their holiday shopping. The city of Ranch Cordova supports our small businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy and preserve our neighborhoods. Advocacy groups, as well as public and private organizations across the country, endorse the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. So now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Ranch Cordova does hereby proclaim November 25th, 2017 as Small Business Saturday and urges the residents of our community and our communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. And I think we're going to take a picture. So everyone's going to go out and shop local at a small business on Saturday. All right. You got 34 days till Christmas, so. Ooh, my mom. <laughs> really? You gonna throw that out? Uh, that's yeah. I'm sorry. That was the truth, though. I sorry. bought one <laughs> gift so far. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, members of the council and Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that recognition. The email that we just sent out does have a link that lists all, if you put in our zip code, will list who the small, as defined as small businesses, not just chamber members, but anyone who's a small business. If you cl click on that, you get a list of really good, um, list of good small businesses. So something just to check out. Awesome, thank you right. very much. Thank you very much. And next, I am told, on that same Saturday, we have a birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Council Member Sander. <laughs> I believe, yeah, we won't meet again until then. So happy birthday. And Garrett, you get to lead us all in song. <laughs> <laughs> it's rough being the new kid. <clears throat> Whoa. <laughs> Ooh, okay, so mic's on. Audience, One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Councilman you. Sander. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. 35 years. Woo! And I'd like to thank the city clerk for cutting off all the microphones up here. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday, David. Thank you. So with that, we'll move on to public comments. Uh, citizens wishing to address the council for any matter on the, consent, on the consent agenda or not on the agenda may do so at this time by completing and submitting a speaker card to the city clerk. And I'll read the rest of this slow in case anybody needs to fill out a card. For items on the agenda, speakers will be called upon to the podium by the mayor at the point on the agenda when the item will be heard. Speakers are encouraged to keep their comments to three minutes or less and state the name and community of residents. Under the provisions of the California Government Code, the city council is prohibited from taking from, I'm sorry, from discussing or taking immediate action on any item not on the agenda, unless it can be demonstrated to be of an emergency nature or the need to take immediate action arose after the posting of the agenda. Do we have any speaker cards? Yes, we do. Carol Limbaga. Carol, <clears throat> Carol Limbaga, Rancho Cordova resident. So here I am again, representing 20 plus folks, talking about the same thing, homeless, but specifically our bums and criminals. Since August, I have defined them, shared with you what we have observed regarding their locations 
and what they do. We have to thank Councilmember David Sander again for jumping into next door chats. It's heating up again. They are now starting to mix the new state marijuana laws with our homeless crimes. At a previous meeting, you saw charts and graphs that made it look good. When the employer, you, are satisfied, the employee, our police, keep their jobs. But I've talked to you before about what is told to us behind closed doors at our pop meetings. Now, you know, some folks comment loudly and others just shake their heads and walk away. That's what happens at our pop meetings when our officers say they could not do such and such because they do not have enough officers or have laws with weak consequences. We need to fund two or three more police officers or fund our own PD. Look what Mayor Steinberg just did at their November 13th meeting. Sac City Council adopted two new aggressive ordinances for panhandlers and unruly behavior in city parks. Finally aggressive, 30 feet instead of 200. If returned within 24 hours, removal. Why can't we? This is our third request for our own aggressive city policy or ordinance now before winter. Give our police some teeth. I'm not knocking it, but why always just rely on a one year or three year outside program such as CSU that doesn't come until 2018? Our police need a bums and criminals policy or ordinance on the books because that will last. This problem will, in the end, always continue to fall largely on the shoulders of local law enforcement. Now, a few years ago, you got ahead of the marijuana scare by developing a policy, and it has saved us. I am formally asking you, as a representative of 20-plus residents, for a future agenda item to explore funding more police and an ordinance or policy for them, our police. Thank you. Thank you. I would just point out that all of the, the items that the city of Sacramento enacted, we ha already have on the books. And the CSU program has been in place for over two years now. I'm not sure what the 2018 references to. Um, so with that, do we have any other public speaker? No. Correct? Okay. So with that, we'll move on to council report. Councilman Gatewood. First, I'd like to start off by um, uh, thanking uh, our veterans uh, on council, Bob, for all your amazing service. Um, it was a good Veterans Day, and I really appreciate everything you did for our country. Uh, that being said, also, I was a speaker at the Folsom Cordova uh, Partnerships 25-year anniversary. I think they've done amazing things for our city, and I was glad to go speak and represent the city. Um, I also did something very interesting, which I was the only one there, and I missed all of you guys, was the Russian Gala. Um, that is an interesting event. I was happy to pronounce their also 20-year anniversary and uh, give them an event where I told the, the whole crowd that at this number one event, you got an award from the number one city, which um, I think, I've forgotten his name, also uh, the Sacramento uh, councilman was there. He stood up and said, oh, it's like that now. <laughs> oh, it's on. You dare say that. Um, uh, Rick Jennings. Rick Jennings then pointed me out and said, oh, you're the number one city? I said, you should sit down. We just got that. Some other stuff. So I told him we got Amazon, and then he got all mad. <clears throat> um, uh, I re there's a couple things that I really enjoy um, sitting on city council about. And it's giving out, the, the first thing is when we really affect, and I can actually see people uh, have been affected in a positive manner by like instantaneously. And the turkey giveaway is one of those things. So I was able to give away 80 turkeys, which I really thank Golden State Water for letting us do that um, through the city. And then I was able to go to Cordova Villa and give it to uh, 50 families. And I have never seen more people brighten up than giving out turkeys to these families that obviously couldn't afford them. And I felt privileged to actually be there. And so I took my, uh, I actually took my kids with me because I wanted to see how the city's, city's actually changing and doing so much good there. And I talked to her and a pop officer 
one of our officers showed up there. And it was just an amazing feeling to actually be affecting our community in such a positive manner to where they're like, oh, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I didn't know what we were going to do. And, and they even, the, the school even came together and built boxes along with the turkeys they were given. So they would give them like stuff to go with the turkey, not just a turkey. So, I mean, like, if I could do more of this, I would, but that is just a heart string. So that's what I was about, did. Thank you. Councilman Sander. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Uh, I had a uh, National Civic League board meeting by phone. I didn't attend in person a few weeks ago, and I'm pleased to announce we have a National Civic League executive director who's coming to Ranch Cordova. He'll be here December 6th and 7th. It's part of a little West Coast tour, or actually Northern California tour. Um, he has not been to Ranch Cordova before. He's been the executive director there, I think, for, uh, Doug's been there for, I think, three or four years now. Um, during the time he was recruited while I was board chair. And so that's a, that's a good chance for us to come together and talk to him, sort of show off what we've done in Ranch Cordova, let him get a three-dimensional view of us, because they use us for an awful lot of examples of how to do things right, they still do. Um, and that's, that's a good opportunity. So if you're interested, let me know. We can set something up. Um, I've been at the, uh, well, I attended Veterans Day, which was an awesome event. Congratulations, Bob. Congratulations to the Cordova Community Council, who's now sort of the manager of that effort, having, grad it having graduated from uh, Pure City Oversight. And I think that location or, uh, you know, some other location around there really has a great potential for that event, and I can't wait to see what it becomes over time. The uh, speaker was a particularly interesting guy, I thought. He told the He's been a field commander, uh, told the, uh, the story about old Jenny, which was the gun that fired the last shot in World War I, and we sort of had that World War I uh, theme going on there. Um, and he mentioned to me while we're sitting there, before he spoke, he said, you know, that was the, that was the howitzer that fired the last shot of World War I. So on the 11th day of the 11th month, the 11th hour, it fired its last shot. That was the last shot fired by U.S. forces in World War I. And then he went on to tell me that his grandfather had commanded that same gun in the uh, Army 2nd Division, and that his father had commanded that same gun, because the gun number apparently stays, the parts may get all swapped out. It's not, no longer the original by any means, no part of it is. But they keep the gun number the same, so there's always an old Jenny. Um, and he has now commanded it. So he's got three, three generations of his family have had command over that particular unit with that particular piece of artillery. It's very interesting, and to see the family pride you know, that was there and the togetherness that happens among those veterans. It's just always a very special day. Operation Gobble, as usual, was fun. The new guy forgot to bring the gloves. Your frostbite, I guess, is fixed now. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's for my community. But yeah, it's, it's great to give away turkeys to great causes. I think most of us went half with veterans and half with the Cordova Food Locker or some mix thereof. It seems like that's where they were headed. So that was a great, great success. And thanks to the... Uh, to the water company for donating those. And finally, I have spent almost a week at National League of Cities, attended a lot of committee meetings, gotten a lot of good ideas, uh, some things you'll be hearing about in the future, some things staff have already heard about. Um, I will mention one, which was a focus on maker spaces. You know, we've had a discussion here about technology spaces, technology incubators. There was a session there that involved kind of the national movement I've seen, because my son's interest in always building, creating things about makers, and, and makers is probably a broader definition than hacker, for example. A maker is someone who's maybe doing food, maybe doing a woodworking, anything that they're making and selling for a profit is basically the definition. And there was a summary in that session about cities that have done this and had economic success as a result of supporting makers. So in some cases, it's something like a commercial kitchen operation, which the little baker is working like crazy in their home trying to bake enough yeah stuff and they just need that extra step to get to the next level. And there were so many examples that came out in that session. I think our economic development policy is going to have to look at that in terms of economic development in Ranch Cordova, how we can grow things from the bottom up. This is not a 100% tech economy. There's a lot of other stuff happening. And we have a particularly unique spot in that economic development spectrum because of all the stuff we've already got on the ground. You know, we have so many manufacturers here in Ranch Cordova, so many specialty firms. We've grown so many um, manufacturing technology companies as a result of that, that this might be something we haven't looked at specifically, something quite that broad, but that might be something we want to engage in. 
I uh, heard some stuff about community engagement. I'll be sharing with Lori Ann and maybe this council at some future point in a great session. Attended a lot of committee meetings, worked on federal policy. And finally, I want to thank you all for your support for my candidacy for second vice president of the NLC. I was not successful in that. The decision is largely made by nominations committee. And I sort of told you the partisan makeup of that committee was about 13 to two against me uh, in terms of how that, how that committee set up. But the good news is um, that that incident has sort of sparked a uh, discussion at the National League of Cities about partisan makeup in general. And so I'm working diligently to turn whatever lemonade exists, or whatever the lemons occurred there into lemonade. And we'll see. And in the meantime, I've been offered uh, um, a tech, the head of a technology committee going forward to examine the impacts of automation, for example, on city governance. So <clears throat> more good things to come from NLC as a result of our involvement there, I think. And I'm still very proud, very happy, very pleased with that organization. I am not at all disturbed by that. I anticipate I might, that might, this might happen to me again, hopefully with a different outcome, but uh, the nature of their process is such that often you have to be nominated a couple of times before it works. But anyway, thank you all for your support. Yeah, there was a few of us there cheering him on when he was uh, there. However, um, you tried, and that was what really what counts on that. Yeah, Veterans Day was uh, very successful. Our theme was uh, focusing on 100 years from when we joined the war in World War I, the war to end all wars, which didn't quite happen. but. It was um, definitely something that I think that had a lot of uh, uh, history in it. We had a lot of people who were there who are uh, World War II veterans, and it's fantastic to see the people who are coming to that event on Veterans Day Memorial Day. Um, turkeys, that was uh, Gobble Day with uh, Food Locker and the Elks. They give uh, dinners to the um, veterans' families, and it's just very uh, gratifying to see the number of people who come out and how many people were able to help on those things. It's just um, unbelievable, and I'm really glad that we were able to do that and uh, to thank the um, um, water company, uh, Golden State, for uh, bringing these turkeys again. Uh, they've been doing that for a good long time. Um, a few things about the National League of Cities. Um, we went to that, and it was... Um, from when we landed on uh, Tuesday and went and registered, and registered, and then on Wednesday there was uh, uh, went to a seminar of the ethical public leadership. Then a day with the Queen, there was a tour we went on to look and look at the um, city. Thursday was um, uh, a Raptor um, Center where they've been able to help. 650 uh, birds of prey uh, who've been uh, hurt, injured on uh, different different things, either being sh hit by a car, or shot, um, whatever it may have been. But um, it's amazing seeing what they had. And then we went to a, a plantation. There was a tour on that, but also there was about five different um, classes of kids from uh, first and second grade to junior high and they were all learning something about history. And you can actually see something, put your hands on it. It makes a difference in trying to read something on a book. Um, that works to a point, but if you can put your hands on it and see actually what it looked like, what it, the building actually was, how people lived in the, oh, 1800, um, it was um, interesting. I went, uh, one more thing I had on that was uh, we went to the uh, Biltmore estate. Now, that's quite a building. If you just bring it up and online and look at it, it's a, like a castle, almost it's huge. It's got, I don't know how many thousands of square feet and how many um, bedrooms it has. And um, one of the things that's kind of interesting, this, uh, uh, they had seven to 10 course meals sometimes in this. I thought, whew, wow. I'm not sure exactly if I could get through that. <laughs> but it was interesting That's anyway. how they dine at Linda's house. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, yes. And then the um, 
Uh, Saturday, we had uh, some other things. There's just so much going on with the National League of Cities that it is really worth our while to spend the money to go there and learn to bring back some ideas. Um, there's one called digital badging, and that's something that West Sacramento is using. So we're going to look into that and see if that could help us because it is something that uh, um, can really help um, just so many things. Um, one more thing I want to say to everyone here and everyone who's watching, um, Happy Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. Thanks, Bob. Linda? Um, so, yes, we do want to, um, we want to thank uh, uh, Bob and the committee and uh, community council for Veterans Day. And I agree with David, uh, the gentleman who was the um, keynote speaker, um, he and I have exchanged correspondence since then. I think that man has done everything there is to do in the Army. And, you know, growing up in the Air Force, I've seen a lot of military people, and, and it, it, it continues to puzzle me as an adult that everybody get transferred every two years because you just learn a job, and then they move you on again, which seems like an incredibly expensive way to live, <laughs> to live a career. But... Um, I, I, I seriously think that man has just done everything that could possibly have been done in the in the army, and he's not through yet, and has offered to participate here in Rancho Cordova more, which would be a tremendous asset. Um, Operation Gobble, we do owe, owe a huge ton of thanks to Golden State uh, Golden State Water. They've done this for probably our entire existence, and they do this all over their service area, and it's a huge. It makes a huge difference, as Garrett said as Garrett personally witnessed for our own residents. Um, regional Transit, you probably uh, read, got hacked today. It was a, it was a genuine cyber hack. And um, the people wanted 7,000 Bitcoins to unfreeze the, unfreeze the, the Who? hack. Who did? <laughs> regional Transit. So, um, so I forwarded that around so that we could all ensure that, that our systems are not uh, connected to regional transit today, and and it's very uh, coincidental that our our late our new IT person is here to um, to offer his opinions about it. But um, supposedly everything is up and running again tonight. Um, we'll see. Um, Garrett and I had the the, the fun experience of uh, going out to dedicate or yeah to dedicate two beautiful murals on Folsom Boulevard at Los Nogales. Um, it's, we put so much time and effort into remodeling Folsom Boulevard. And uh, in some places, it's really uh, benefited the neighborhoods. And in some places, it's just benefited the business community or those of us who, who travel Folsom Boulevard. But this was one of our really rare opportunities to truly do something important for a very tiny neighborhood and to help create some pride and bring back some um, some sense of place to them. Uh, uh, removed the awful old fences falling down in a variety of places and uh, put up a lovely masonry wall. And now we have these two beautiful murals. Unfortunately, one of the artists has moved out of state abruptly, but we were joined by Sid and Donine Wellman, who uh, did the, the Lincoln Highway themed mural. And um, it was a day like today. We were sort of fighting off the rain, but we managed to get the managed to get the the ribbons cut, and and uh, we do hope that the people who live in that little neighborhood are pleased with um, pleased with the results. And like Bob, I know we all want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, and um, whatever you do on Thanksgiving, or go up to get a Christmas tree, or whatever, um, be sure to have fun and be safe. Thank you. And although it's not agendized, hopefully I can do my report. Um, <clears throat> I was not able to spend as much time in NLC as I would have liked this past week, <clears throat> but I did get in long enough to attend the Community and Economic Development uh, Committee meeting. Um, and we passed various resolutions, one of which that I think is going to, there's going to be some additional discussion was around um, rent to own programs. Um, which, as somebody in affordable housing, and actually we have, pro my nonprofit has programs that actually do rent own programs. Um, I guess in a lot of communities, and this is kind of an emerging topic that I, I wasn't that as aware of, um, 
since our meeting in, in Henderson, this was brought up that I guess in a lot of communities, people actually go through these programs and think that they've owned a home for 20 or 30 years to find out that they don't, that and the title hadn't transferred. And um, it's, I, I guess it's a, it's a very large, uh, people are, are, landlords and owners are abusing it a lot in a lot of minority and lower income communities um, and really taking rights and lots of wealth away from uh, different communities. So the committee actually has stated position asking for HUD and the CFPB to look into um, additional uh, steps that they can take to protect consumers and protect buyers from it. Um, but it's something that we should be, be keeping a close eye on in high cost communities like California, where it is a very effective tool for helping lower income people become homeowners eventually. There's a lot of matching funds and things that you can do if you approach it appropriately. Um, but unfortunately, there are a lot of bad actors in this in this industry that are working on it. Um, I would want to echo everything that everybody said about Operation Gobble. It was a lot of fun. Um, this is, I think, only the second time I was able to get to it. Um, yeah, last year was actually the first time. I, I have to say, the first couple of years, I really didn't understand what people were asking me, that I had to pick who to give turkeys to, and that they were given a gift that I was paying. It just didn't make a lot of sense until I got to actually see it, but it, it's a lot of fun, and I really do appreciate um, Golden State for doing that. Um, we had our Two by two with Folsom Cordova since our last meeting. Um, David, I don't think you were able to join now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so we got a handful of updates and uh, talked through Measure H and what plans Sarah might have there. Um, it, it, to me, it's, I think this is a really promising relationship for us to grow with, with, with her. Um, the fact that they hired somebody from outside of the district, I think, says a lot about where they hope to go as a district comparatively to where I think they were hoping to go when they hired Debbie. Um, and so the opportunities to look at some more innovative programs that aren't in the district now, I think we really have a great shot. Um, I did have quite a bit of traveling just for work and then personal, so don't have a ton of other things. Um, I wanted to thank staff and Maria, who I don't, there she is, for coordinating the, um, the city photo last week. Um, we're going to Photoshop a couple of your guys' heads in there, um, but three of us were able to attend, um, and it was a lot of fun, and luckily it, 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 the, the rain didn't come down too hard till right near the end, but it, it all worked out, and we got it done. And then, um, I, again, I was traveling, so I unfortunately was not able to be at the Veterans Day event. Again, thank you, Bob, and, and everyone else for attending, and Bob, for all of your dedication to that community. Um, and then one other thing, because I see the chief is in the back there, I did get an email this week from a resident of the, the Veterans Village um, with some concerns around harassment um, and some, some bike thefts at the community. Um, and I shared that with the chief and, and Cyrus. And the following day, two individuals, I believe, were arrested. Um, and I, I got that afternoon, I got an email from the individual that's living at, at the Veterans Village thanking me for what our police force does on you know on a daily basis, but literally within 12 hours, there there had been an arrest, and 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 they went over and met with the residents and talked to them. And I just want to say kudos, chief, to everyone on your team for for doing that. Um, that was a great example of where somebody who didn't think that they were listened to, you know, formerly homeless person, shoots off an email, frustrated, sends it to the mayor, um, and you know, within hours we had something addressed. So that was really awesome. So great job on that. And so with that, uh, city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a few uh, brief items. Uh, first of all, we did have, uh, I participated in a regional manager's meeting uh, last week. Great discussion on uh, shared economy. We're looking for services that we share as, uh, as a region and see if we could find some ways to partner so we can uh, have economy of scale and, and be able to do some of our tasks more effectively. So it's really good discussions happening on that. Uh, we have also issued a um, request for proposal for our uh, uh, permitting software. If uh, most of you are aware that we've had issues, this is the program that we have used for years uh, uh, for our um, building permit and code enforcement and other, other permitting <coughs> programs and software that we have. And we hope that uh, we would be able to get a good response. I just wanted to make sure that if we have any local businesses interested in uh, participating and submitting proposals, that would be uh, 
uh, draw your attention to the proposal that's on our website. So hope, hope to, be, to, to get a good response. And also great timing with uh, Rod, and uh, this is one of the Rod's, um, Rod Van Busker that you met earlier today, the, the, he, this would be one of his um, high priority projects that he will work on. And lastly, I just wanted to uh, let the council know that I have received notification from uh, two of our tenants that they would ex like to extend their leases. Uh, we have uh, uh, Cordova Recreation and Parks District. The lease expires uh, soon in 2018, and they have expressed an interest to renew the lease for another three years. So we'll be working on, on the lease extension. We've also um, we've been working with uh, both the Chamber of Commerce and Cordova Community Council for the extension of the lease space. That, that lease also expires in early 2018, and our staff is working with, uh, uh, with both the Chamber and the Cordova Community Council for that lease extension. So those will be happening soon. That's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thanks, Cyrus. So with that, we'll move on to the consent calendar. So consent calendar items consist of matters deemed routine and non-controversial by staff. Unless a member of the council wishes to pull an item for individual consideration, all items will be approved by one motion. Citizens wishing to address the council uh, for any matter on the consent agenda may do so at this time by completing and submitting a speaker card to the city clerk. But for items on the agenda, speakers will be called upon will be called up to the podium by the mayor at the point on the agenda when the item will be heard. Speakers are encouraged to keep their comments to three minutes or less and state their name and community of residence. So first, um, do we have any speaker cards on the consent? No, we do not. Okay. Do we have any items to pull? Please pull nine point two. Any other items to pull? Okay, then I will move approval of nine point one, nine point three, four, and five. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Council Member Gatewood. That's an aye. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sander. Aye. Council Member McGarvey. Aye. Vice Mayor Budge. Yes. Mayor Terry. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, we will take up item 9.2, which is the quarterly treasurer's report. Do you have a question? Yeah, can you go ahead and explain that, that, what we talked about? Thank you. So the question that was posed earlier by Council Member Gatewood uh, to me was a question regarding the market value of the portfolio <coughs> dropping below the cost basis of the portfolio. And just to provide some explanation, we're in a rising interest rate environment. And so when we're holding some of our longer term investments, the market value as interest rates rise, those longer term investments tend to decline on paper. However, uh, something to keep in mind is that we hold our portfolio, we hold things till maturity, and so we will see the full recovery of those when, when they mature. And then the other thing I would like to add is that overall the portfolio is very well diversified, both as far as um, types of investments and then the duration, we are purposely keeping a vast majority of the portfolio short during this rising interest rate environment to try to combat those losses. So basically my uh, question, just so everyone's clear, is uh, it, when you look at it, it looks like we lost $600,000 of our portfolio. So I had a question if that was an issue or how is it being addressed. And so what I was told was that that it's it, we should inspect that in, uh, in long term and it should be retaining its value or going above it. All those accounting tricks. So just, just to clarify, so in a rising interest rate environment, uh, a bond that sits in our portfolio that used to have a more attractive rate now has a slightly less attractive rate because other interest rates are rising around it. Those bonds are fixed rate or coupon rate. Um, other bonds now are, or general interest rates are rising, so the value, the premium people were going to pay for this is less. Correct. And so that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. But the core value of it is still the same. It's paying the interest rate we bought it at, it has, it'll eventually pay us the full amount back that we purchased it for, because we're only buying top grade stuff. Correct. Um, but in the interim, how you would value that is less because other interest rates are rising. So does that sort of summarize what the issue is? Perfect. Okay. And people pay a premium in a low interest rate environment. Right. In the high. So I, I also had a question, Kim, and it was the one I emailed you earlier today. Um, and maybe you can give a 
a verb. Do you have that stuff in front of you? A yeah, verbal? I, brought the, I brought a copy of the email. So do you want to ask the question first? Sure, I'll ask the question. So, uh, you know, a resident seeing this report might wonder, why does the city have $100 million plus million sitting around? Why aren't you spending that on something? And the answer is, of course, there's probably 300 little categories that these dollars are pledged for in many cases. And so I said, is there a way to sort of summarize what these reserves are being held for? What purpose, why are, why are we keeping this? What's the purpose of it? Aside from the general fund reserve, but that's, that's one purpose. But what are the other purposes? And so Kim sort of responded with some broad categories. Yeah, just uh, kind of generally speaking, uh, we have $128 million in cash on hold as of September 30th, 2017. And just kind of broad categories, how that's allocated just to provide some additional clarification. So about 25 million of that amount is considered general fund, some of that being general fund reserve, and then some of that being with uh, funding ongoing operations out of the general fund. Uh, 50, over $50 million of that is actually transportation related money. So those are uh, our traffic impact fees, gas tax measure A, a variety of transportation dollars that have to be used for specific projects. In many cases, we hold those dollars as we accumulate for major large projects. So those, uh, we hold those until we have sufficient funds on hand to actually do the project. Uh, about $21 million of that is for uh, impact fees from the Sunrise De Douglas development area, and those are for improvements that have to be made specific to that new development area. Uh, we have about $10 million in the storm drain fund. Again, this is a restricted use fund. It's an enterprise fund, and so that $10 million can only be used for uh, expenditures related to storm drain. It, does that include maintenance? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's not just capital improvements. It's maintenance. Correct. Okay. okay. Um, we have about $12 million that is for a variety of other special revenue projects, some of the com uh, community facilities districts. And so those are monies that we actually hold that does not belong to the city. We hold them as a custodian. And so there's about $12 million that the city is holding that's part of that cash balance. It's not technically the city's money. It's for other agencies or other items. And then finally, we have about $10 million that are restricted for specific purposes like grant funds and things of that nature. So that provides a very high level overview of how the money is allocated. And in many cases, we're talking about funds that are uh, specifically restricted for a certain purpose or project. Okay. Any Thank other you. questions for staff? Thank you very much. I think that's very clarifying. And if there was a way to have our system spit that out, on a regular basis added to this report, I think that'd be illuminating for people. Yeah, I'll look into that. And if this system can't do it, then I'm sure the next one will. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Okay, then I will move item 9.2. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Council Member Gatewood. Aye. Council Member Sander. Aye. Council Member McGarvey. Aye. Vice Mayor Budge. Yes. Mayor Terry. Aye. Okay, motion carries. We do not have any consent public hearing items. We do not have any public hearing items, so we'll move on to regular calendar items. Look how fast we've gotten through. Great job, everybody. So then our next item will be 12.1, a resolution numbered 132-2017, authorizing the city manager to wait, am I? Yeah. Authorizing the city manager to grant non-exclusive franchise and execute agreements with multiple waste hauling companies for the collection of solid waste, recyclable, organic materials from businesses and multifamily properties. Uh, good evening, Mayor Terry and members of the council. For the record, I'm Steve Harriman with the Department of Public Works. We should be having a PowerPoint presentation. I'm here tonight to uh, give an update on our commercial solid waste programs. Uh, we're going to give a quick update on our commercial non-exclusive franchise agreements, which is actually item 12.1 on the agenda. And we're also going to give a quick update on uh, some new state laws that address organic waste collection and recycling. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In Rancho Cordova, we have a non-exclusive franchise system, system for the collection of uh, waste and recyclables from businesses and multifamily properties. Uh, this allows multiple waste hauling companies to come to Rancho Cordova and compete in an open market environment for commercial and multifamily accounts. Uh, some cities in California have an exclusive system, meaning there's only one waste hauler that is approved by the city, uh, and all of that business is done by one waste hauling company. 
Uh, in Rancho Cordova, we have a non-exclusive. So any garbage company that comes and, and applies for a franchise may compete in our city for business. Uh, under our system, customers may negotiate their own rates for service, and they can select their own service provider of their choice, and they can uh, change service providers if they're not happy with the service that they are receiving. Uh, the non-exclusive system is uh, what we use basically in the region in Sacramento, and we have used it in Rancho Cordova ever since we incorporated. We currently have 10 waste hauling companies uh, in Rancho that hold non-exclusive franchises. Uh, the current franchise agreements expire at the end of December 2017. So Resolution 132-2017 allows the city manager to execute new franchise agreements that will start on January 1st of 2018. And all 10 of our current franchisees have submitted an application for a new franchise. Uh, the new franchise agreement is basically a five-year term. There is a 10% franchise fee on waste collection and disposal revenue. That is consistent with the current franchise agreement. I would just add we do not charge any franchise fee on recycling, and that is as to incentivize uh, recycling activities. One of the new items in our agreement is uh, a bulky item service for multifamily properties. And in our residential franchise agreement, uh, our residential uh, owners get three pickups per year, and it's built into their rate. Uh, but our multifamily customers do not have that service. Uh, so in the new franchise agreement, the only requirement really is that the, the franchisees offer the service to their customers, and if one of their customers requires service or requests service, they provide it within 48 hours. So a multifamily property may self-haul their material, they may have an employee do it. The main thing is, is we want the franchisees to make their customers aware that they provide this service uh, and that they have it available. It, I know for a fact that we have some illegal dumping activities, you know, around multifamily properties, and so this is one of the ways that we're working to address that. We had several meetings uh, with, with the waste haulers and the Rental Housing Association to go over this, and so we're hopeful. Uh, and finally, the new franchise agreement uh, requires the franchisees to assist with the implementation of some new laws. And, so I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about some of the new state laws that are affecting Rancho Cordova. Um, <clears throat> but by way of history, the first real revolution in waste management in California was AB 939. It was signed into law by George Duke Magian in 1989. And fundamentally, it requires 50% recycling. So for, of every ton of waste that we generate in Rancho Cordova, half of it has to uh, be recycled or composted and may not go to the landfill. Uh, as a result of AB 939 in Rancho Cordova, we have uh, prepared and adopted planning documents. We've, we have approved many contracts, ordinances. We've implemented new programs. We've done significant uh, public education. We do an annual report every year to the state uh, to demonstrate our compliance with uh, AB 939. The good news is our diversion rate today is uh, a little bit north of 65%. So we are very successful in that regard. Uh, but many of the programs that we see today, residential and businesses, are a result of AB 939. And we are on the eve of what we call the Revolution 2.0, which is sort of the next uh, major move here in the waste business. And that is really about organics recycling. And the primary objective is to remove organics from landfills. Uh, and this is all really being done in the name of uh, reduction of greenhouse gases. And so some people say, well, what's the big deal? Why, do we, why are we concerned about it? And uh, in California, something like 30 to 40% of the waste that we currently dispose in landfills uh, is organics, either food waste uh, or uh, yard clippings. Uh, organics become uh, anaerobic in a landfill, uh, which generates methane gas. And methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, much more potent than CO2. Uh, and by current estimates, about 25% of uh, greenhouse gases today is a result of methane emissions. So the California legislature has been extremely 
uh, aggressive, I would say, uh, with implementing passing laws that really address both climate change and organics in landfills. Uh, AB 32, of course, was signed by uh, Governor Schwarzenegger in 2006 uh, and requires basically you know, global reductions of, uh, of greenhouse gases. And then more recently, we have these laws that are really addressing organics in landfills. And uh, the legislature has sent a very clear message that they would like uh, jurisdiction in the state to, uh, to work on getting organics out of landfills. So the one that I really want to focus on tonight is AB 1826. Um, it requires businesses and multifamily properties to separate organics from trash, implement a collection program, uh, educate employees and tenants about uh, how the new program works. And the law defines these covered generators. And so on April 1st of 16, any business or multifamily property that generated eight cubic yards per week of organics was a covered generator. The next tier is January 1st of 17, which is four yards of organics. And January 1 of 19 is four yards of trash per week. So what does that mean in Rancho Cordova? Those are sort of abstract numbers. Uh, in that first tier, eight cubic yards or more per week of organics, we only have 24 customers. So those are very large scale properties. Uh, and the good news is 16 of those 24 are currently in compliance and they have organics recycling uh, programs in place. The next tier, which is January 1st of 2017, we have 150 customers in that and about 20 are in compliance Jeez. so we've got some work to do but the real news here is that on january 1st of 2019 we have about 700 commercial businesses and multifamily properties in rancho cordova uh, that fall under that tier and so we have a major sort of uh, shift in our waste management system on the horizon here i want to make sure the council uh, is aware of that so uh, what's next? I think there's a great opportunity here for the city to be an educator and facilitator for local businesses. We uh, have worked on and are continuing to work on uh, some printed uh, materials and doing site visits. One of the things we're working on is a piece called a toolbox for businesses, which is something that we could sort of leave behind and it would be a very simple summary of the requirements some signage that they could use in the business, some employee training documents, something that we can leave behind that really would allow our businesses to get started uh, immediately. Uh, and of course, updates to our website. The picture there on the right is uh, from VSP, and we did a site tour there last week. And of course, they are uh, have a good start on it. And so you can see here the way that they've arranged it is there's landfill, and then compost and organics and recycling. And this is, I would say, sort of what the future is uh, going to look like. You will notice on the compost, it looks like what are disposable uh, cups and plates, and they have actually started using these uh, corn and soy-based products that are compostable at VSP. So we're very impressed with that. Um, so one of the things that we're working on is what we're calling the City Hall Zero Waste Program. And as all of our neighbors in Rancho Cordova are going to be required to do this, we would really like to be an example. Uh, and we would like to be a demonstration site. Uh, you will recall that the Republic Services contract that, that you approved in June, one of the items in that contract is Republic Services is going to help us uh, with the city hall project, and so, uh, so we're going to be looking at you know waste reduction, uh, proper separation. You know what is go go to the landfill, what is recycling, logistics, training, but really we want to be an example in our community of how we're going to uh, implement these programs. Um, there's a lot of obstacles. This is not easy. Uh, the logistics of the collection is difficult. Uh, we're going to have new containers and signage, staff training. The coordination with janitorial at every facility is a major issue. Uh, coordination with third party vendors, for example, at City Hall, we have event planners and caterers and also monitoring performance. So uh, this is a, a major lift for all of us. And again, this is sort of- Let I'm me sorry. Um, ask a question. Sure. How is this going to affect our customers because we've had 
some um, questions over the last few years about where their garbage cans are going to be. Are we going to be getting new garbage cans? Are they going to have no responsibilities for these new garbage cans they're going to get if there are some? Um, what are we going to be doing on that as far yeah. as the customers are concerned and the residential are you thinking area? On the, on the residential side? Yeah, so on the residential side, I think that is coming at some point in the future, and that was an item that we contemplated when we were negotiating the residential contract. AB 1826 really addresses businesses and multifamily properties. Okay. Uh, there are some jurisdictions, mostly in the Bay Area, that have started residential food waste collection. Um, most of them are combining yard waste and food waste into one can. Uh, and that may be something that we will talk about in the future. I, it's visionary, <laughs> but we're not we're not quite on that one yet. So, so this one is uh, a picture I think of sort of what you know what this is going to look like in City Hall and other businesses. I mean, we're we're going to have in effect is what of sort of a three stream uh, program with composting. Uh, the uh, the model that is emerging in California and certainly in Sacramento is a model of uh, anaerobic digestion and. Uh, anaerobic digestion basically means taking the organic waste and taking it to a facility that decomposes it anaerobically. And there are basically two byproducts of anaerobic digestion. My pointer isn't working. One is uh, fertilizer or soil amendment. And so that would go to the farm, which produces crops, Oops. Uh, which goes to the table, which generates organic waste, and then goes back to an anaerobic digester. So that's sort of, in theory, a closed loop. Uh, then the other byproduct of anaerobic digestion are, are heat and energy. And the energy can be used to generate electricity, or it can also be used uh, for transportation fuel. So there is a facility locally on Fruit Ridge Road uh, called, uh, actually it was Clean World Partners, and they have sold that uh, facility. And there's a new company that I can't recall the name of. But basically, uh, the organics goes into these large tanks. Uh, it's inoculated with some bacteria, and it decomposes anaerobically, and it generates uh, methane gas. And I, I know Vice Mayor Budge has been there. I, we were at an event there one time were. several years ago. Uh, but, and then there's, so there's the digester, and there's also a fueling station uh, that is owned by Atlas Disposal, which is one of our franchise companies, uh, Dave and Nick uh, Sikich. Uh, and uh, so basically the, the digester generates methane gas. They blend it with pipeline gas from PG&E, and they sell a transportation fuel at that facility. I have a question again. Um, when we first became a city, Michael Kohler from the uh, rendering plant said, you know, they have an awful lot of methane gas that they do there, and he wanted to start using that and put in an um, electric company, start providing power uh, using that. Is that something that is, I mean, people just want to get rid of methane gas. Methane gas is not, is that something that can be used Absolutely. Uh, effectively? You I bet. Mean, rather than Absolutely. being unhappy yeah. about it, the gas is coming from cows or whatever, but mm -hmm. there should be some way to uh, effectively use that. Right. You know? And actually, that's a great point. And this facility actually has spent a lot of time trying to get a hold of products like that, you know, rendering material or food processing, uh, um, cannery waste, those kinds of things, because it's, it's very rich for this kind of facility. And absolutely. And actually, and you also have large quantities of it in a relatively compact area, which is very helpful. So. Um, so uh, you will recall that in the residential contract that you approved in June, one of the items in there was that Republic start replacing our residential truck fleet with compressed natural gas trucks. Uh, the contract required that they start in uh, the middle of 2018. I'm happy to report they've already started uh, replacing. So this is one of our new residential trucks that is fueled on compressed natural gas. Uh, and it's fueling at uh, Clean World Partners. So our, our residential trucks are already um, actually running on food waste. And so that's What's really the thing great. in the front? So this is really interesting for, you know, oh, know, those of us that are impressed by garbage trucks, but this is a very <laughs> impressive garbage truck. 
This is a box that has a arm on the side. And so it empties it in there and it allows the driver to see what is uh, in the can, as opposed to the old style where that had an arm on the side, the driver could never see it. The truck is going to tell on all of this. The, they're they're going to get better at at making sure that you're everybody's doing it right. Uh, this is also a, a ten ton truck as opposed to the older trucks, yeah, which bigger. were eight ton. But it has a shorter wheelbase, so it turns much easier in cul-de-sacs and those things. So. Uh, it's a actually very impressive vehicle. And so our entire fleet is converting to these natural gas uh, trucks. And so there's a picture. You can see there's a can uh, on the side of it there. So when this little box gets full, it lifts it up into the top of the truck. Um, and so that's uh, on. Um, does it drive with it in the down position in normal traffic? It does. Oh, no, I'm sorry. In normal traffic, it's in the up position. OK. So yeah, one of the things that that. So do we have a problem with so, overhead clearance? <laughs> uh, no, they need well. They need to make sure that they do it in a place where there's no overhead wires or trees or anything. Uh, be, but isn't but it, the it's up like position a, isn't that all the way over and tucked back into the back of the truck? When it goes, I think up, I've seen it. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't actually, stick. The, the sit arm 10 goes feet up. The there's thing. a the hoppers right here, so it dumps right here. Basically, right. and when it's in that position, this entire box sits in there, and it it's yeah. very uh, streamlined. Okay. So, it's like it's like another foot <laughs> taller than it is right now. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, that's that's good to know. Right. Gosh, and here, if there's, if there's this much exciting innovation in solid waste, so maybe we all need to go to the annual solid waste meeting. Yeah. We could see it in action. That's right. I'll tell you if you type YouTube, because um, <laughs> who who is it that was trying to convince? Uh, I think it was last year's at, at, at NLC. They were trying to convince us to do the in-ground dumpsters. Oh. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That actually, like, they hit a button, and they actually come out of the ground. Huh. Um, and then they dump them in. But, the, yeah, you, you got to you gotta dig a hole in it. But for a lot of the new commercial development in California, that's where they're going to, is yeah. not even having dumpsters above ground anymore. Oh I think we've left that at Air Force bases in 1952. Don't you think? Really? But this is a photograph uh, on Tiffany West, which is also a newly paved road. So it's a new garbage truck on a newly paved road. And so it's uh, especially beautiful. So in conclusion, uh, I think uh, you know, there are big changes coming uh, for local businesses. And our role is going to be one of we want to be a facilitator and an educator. And we really want to help our businesses uh, and waste haulers. We are going to do a significant amount of outreach and education and site visits as we roll this thing out. Uh, the state is fairly serious. I mean, we you know, potentially might be on the hook for some sort of penalty, but I don't see anything like that happening because we are uh, very aggressive about this. And again, we also really uh, take our role as a demonstration site very seriously for City Hall. So. Okay, so That's I it have for me. questions for staff. Yeah, questions and comments. Um, so number one, um, Congratulations on getting up to the 65 plus percent diversion rate because we probably all remember when we were a little low and, and really were threatened with sanctions. So this is really good. Um, number two, I am absolutely thrilled that we're going to be a demonstration site because I really ever, you know, that ever since Costco came out with their green bins, I have been wanting us to do something like that here and here at the city hall. Um, and um, in terms of the methane uh, being converted into energy, um, I, that uh, fuel station said CNG. So is it producing, are they at the point that they're producing enough that they could fuel fleets like regional transit? Currently, no. Currently, they are... Uh, blending, like I said, pipeline gas and methane. Their current permit is for 25 tons a day of organic waste. They're working on a permit for 100 tons a day. Uh, the point at which they, you know, I, I don't know exactly how much fuel that is and exactly how much they're going to, to generate. I do know that the city of Sacramento uh, fuels vehicles there. Uh, while I was there, a bus from Sac State uh, did the runs on compressed natural gas uh, was there. So many of large scale fleets are 
converting their systems to natural gas. Well, the the other thing, I mean, it's probably um, somewhat market driven. If they knew that there were markets out there, uh, and that they would have a, 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 a market for their product. That's right. And, and actually, with all of these organics that are going to be generated and need to go somewhere, you know, the, the hope and the vision is that the private sector will respond by generating anaerobic digestion facilities that right. can respond to the marketplace. Right. So um, uh, the multi-bin uh, larger garbage collection stations you see those all over Golden One Center, and yeah. they're really they're really very tidy, and um, they have very fancy ones. Everything over there is very fancy, right? But those are very fancy. That's a great point, actually. The the Golden One Center is, is considered, you know, like a zero waste yeah. facility, and they actually have sorting stations somewhere I in there, and they separate their material. Um, so, do you anticipate doing something like that, or do you anticipate? I mean, we seriously have have never had enough trash cans in the American River rooms of any sort. And sometimes the recycle cans just seem to disappear, which is very frustrating. Right. But um, do you envision uh, the red and green and blue bins like they do at Costco, or do you envision a larger station like that? So we, we need it to be somewhat flexible because we have different types of events and different sizes of events. And uh, we're working with Todd and Laurel, which is fantastic, and working on a configuration. So I, I don't know exactly the answer. I know that in our, our em, like employee break areas, we'll probably have a more you know, large stationary type of a thing. Uh, but for you know, our meeting rooms and events, it'll probably be something more flexible. Uh, but, but, you know, we really hope to have better containers, better signage, better employee training. Uh, you know, we, we, can, we can step up our game here. Um, so final question, um, when do we see this at home? So that is a, that is a great question. Uh, the, uh, in AB 1826, it says that um, Half of the, organ the organic waste going to landfill in 2014 must be cut in half by 2020. And if it isn't, then there's going to be new requirements coming down the line for residential and commercial organics. So uh, we will see how that, how that plays out. 2020. In 2020. We, ha we have to cut the 2014 amount in half by okay. 2020. Correct. Well, I, I am totally looking forward to it. Um, we had to eliminate our compost because of uh, animals getting into it, and I oh. need a replacement big time. Fantastic. David? Yeah, Steve, I got a question about dumpster security. So I should have reported, actually, that I at the council reports earlier, but I met with property owner at Safeway and our uh, deputy district attorney and our police department and code enforcement staff and economic development to talk about the issues they've got in oh. garbage at Safeway, which of course contains food and therefore attracts dumpster divers. Um, they stated, you know, the challenge is they can lock it, Safeway can lock it, um, but their trash haul are sort of unwilling to deal with that situation. Hmm. They don't, they don't want it locked because that means they have to pull up, get out of the truck, unlock it, dump the dumpster, get back out of the truck, lock it again. Who's their hauler? I don't know. I'll, I'll just tell you, my office in Oak Park, where public service picks ours up, they're all locked in Oak Park. So the, <laughs> interestingly, uh, the property owner there at Safeway has 40 or 50 properties up and down the state hmm. and says this is an extraordinarily common uh, complaint from grocery stores, that their trash haulers will not secure the dumpster or allow them to secure the dumpster. Yeah. So I'm surprised to hear that. And I, and I will follow up and find and see who their hauler is. Uh, in the city and county of Sacramento, there's actually a requirement that all dumpsters be locked all the time. That's right. The problem is many customers leave their key in the lock and then the keys get <laughs> stolen and it's a master key. So then the guy who took it has a key then to uh, every dumpster. But uh, there's also specialized kinds of dumpsters that have a, a gravity bar, so when the, the, the bin goes up and dumps, it actually it unlocks. It unlocks, right. 
But I will follow up on that because yeah. it, it's really important in certain kinds of situations that we keep them. And it's, and it's probably, you know, I think about the security of that. It's probably not just, I Googled around a little bit, it's probably not just food. You know, it's, this is also a big issue for us at used goods stores where there's stuff that are, that are donated to the used goods store and oh, they, don't, they don't accept it. They throw it in the dumpster. Piles up out back. And then it's all over the parking lot in the neighborhood yeah. as a result. Well, David, I, I would even tell you that during the storms, uh, the number of people that just go there to get out from the rain, just going inside mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. Um, we have that problem in my office all the time. But ours, we don't have a key. We have a combo, and Republic knows what it is, and they unlock it. Um, I have to replace locks a lot during the year because people cut them off to try to get in there. But, um, yeah, they have to be secure. But, yeah, we don't even have a key. There's no master key mm. or anything like that. Actually, a combo is a good idea. That's, and that's what we use, and, and, and it's – yeah, I, I knew it was a law in Sacramento, but yeah, our hauler, that, that sounds like just a, a lazy hauler. So is, is it a rule for us? It is not currently, but it is one that we could certainly... We should start thinking about that. That's you probably that into the something we It would be in our ordinance. I think it would probably be more appropriate in the ordinance, but that's a relatively but, easy... But in these contracts that you're about to renew, can you write that into the contract? Uh, that we could. People have to cooperate with, uh, mm -hmm. with locking and relocking? Yep, I think we should probably do it in both because the the contract only addresses the waste sure. hauler, mm -hmm. and then and we could yeah we could certainly well, do that. Well, but when we when we license their franchise, they they have to comply with it. I mean, and, yeah. and like you said, if you just take the city of Sacramento and the county of Sacramento, that's like two thirds of everyone basically, right? <laughs> in this county, are already doing it. I, I I honestly didn't know that we didn't have a requirement like that. Yeah, I think we should put that through as a simple fix. Sure. Yeah, actually, yeah, that. given that we adopted county ordinances, I don't know why it isn't in our ordinance already. Well, because I think it was added later. It was actually, when I was at the city of Sacramento, something that we worked on. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so that's been a recent addition. To Correct. It. Interesting. I just remember having to do the city's um, solid, waste, um, solid waste plan. Uh, in order to submit permit applications there. Right, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, a simple technical correction there could probably just take us a couple of meetings. Sure. Right, first reading, second reading. Add something that Save Sacramento's already done, the county's already done. Um, well, now that would be the ordinance, but in the meantime, as you negotiate these new right. franchises, you, we can... It's a, with it's a council direction, you the could branches, do that, right? Yeah, and yeah, I'm sure yeah. that the haulers would be fine with it. And, of course, there's also so ident identity theft, information theft... You know, business security issues. Actually, know. in theft of recyclables, it's really in the hauler's interest to do it as well. And right. you, you can always determine the price of cardboard because when it's low, there's cardboards overflowing in the bins. But when it goes up, it's and all then that gone. also blocks Ill, some illegal dumping. You know, because they're unscrupulous right. contractors who'll have stuff they need to get rid of, and they'll just drive around and look for an open dumpster. So we could definitely just put it in the agreements themselves without. We could add it to the ordinance later if everyone wants to, but our ordinance is kind of broad. It says you have to follow these rules and anything in our agreement. And so the agreement's the place where we can add those details. You know, um, actually, the other thing I've seen in some jurisdictions, um, there are jurisdictions uh, uh, that simply, they have very minimal rules, and then they say you have to, um, you have to abide by the hauler's requirements. This is commercial. But you have to abide by the haulers' requirements, and so whoever it was at that time, and at that time, BFI had most everything in Northern California, and um, and so we would simply get whatever their local requirements were. So you're right; it does work, but but that takes Steve um, ensuring that um, the local haulers that we contract with are uh, enforcing the kinds of uh, rules that we want enforced. Well, and I, I think another issue, that, David, that you've brought up, I, I want to say it was you, um, and Steve, you were just talking about it, that there are, there's technology that exists now that the dumpster can be locked without an enclosure and everything else, right? So we have a bunch of businesses that were never required to build an enclosure when they opened, mm -hmm. and so they just have a dumpster sitting in the back of their building. Right. Um, but if we make this requirement, then they would need to then provide them with a dumpster that only opens when it's, and that there's there's some mechanism to to locking even a, a, an open dumpster. Because I what I'm talking about is you know we have a trash enclosure, then that's where it is, and that is locked. But we've also had an issue with a ton of them. They're just sitting behind a building, so then they would need to come into compliance and 
implement technology that that so that the dumpster would lock. And right? even the even the enclosure may not be enough because I mean I, I called the PD and watched PD show up and deal with uh, a dumpster diver who had just jumped over the enclosure wall. Yep, that happens in my office all the time. Yeah. I mean it. The, Besides putting a lid on it, which we've actually talked about in my office, um, it's still better than not. And if most of the mess, at least if you're driving around it, you don't see it. I can see it from the second story of my office because I can look down at it. But it's better than a dumpster sitting out behind a building. The ordinance would also protect us against a business owner who didn't want to cooperate, I suppose. I mean, I, I would I would think that we should update the ordinance no matter what. Yeah. But give the direction now and, and start down the path. So do it we can simply, certainly uh, quickly. Uh, put it into the franchise ag agreement, I think, now. There may be some other ordinance cleanup items coming, so maybe we okay. can sort of put that in the, in the future, yeah. In the residential contract, for example, we've had details on what you need to have in your, you know, your bills or your notices to customers or anything like that, so we can work that kind of level of detail into those agreements. I, I wouldn't delay this long because obviously we've got a homeless crisis out there on the streets and this is a this is a serious avenue for them to obtain, you know, things that do not benefit us as a community. No, and, and the waste haulers have been very helpful and cooperative. And I think that if it, you know, we let them know that it was the wish of the council to implement this and we put it into the franchise agreement, I think we'll make at least a lot of headway. Uh, do we have any public comment on this item? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, well, and you, you did say that you think the haulers are, are being very um, cooperative. I'd love to know who is hauling at Safeway that somehow is telling them that they can't do it. I'm going to so, find out tomorrow morning. I guess it's not one of the ones that were. Could very well be a he said, she said, where the Safeway folks don't want to have to deal with the locked dumpster, so they're blaming the, the waste hauler, you know. But neither, in any case, it's it's an unacceptable situation yeah, currently. I realize. If we're ready, then I'll. Uh... If we're ready, I'll move adoption of resolution number one three two dash, two thousand seventeen, with the addition of language, uh, some language requiring the haulers that we contract with to cooperate with uh, securing the facilities. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Roll call, please. Council Member Gatewood. Aye. Council Member Sander? Aye. Council Member McGarvey? Aye. Vice Aye. Mayor Budge? Yes. Mayor Terry? Aye. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. So with that, we'll move on to item 12.2, responsible investments for a stronger pro economy proposal. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. I'm Kim Drancara Giorgio, Administrative Services Director. On November 6, the City Council received a letter which was attached to the staff report for this item and a proposed policy from Region Finance requesting consideration, city's consideration of the City's participation in the Responsible Investment for Stronger Economy proposal. Essentially, this proposal requests that the city consider reallocating funds that are currently invested in the local agency investment fund, which is a state investment pool, into qualifying locally headquartered banks. Uh, just for some perspective, uh, the city's current balance in LEAF is about $9.3 million. Um, I, this evening, we have Josh Wood from Region Finance here who uh, is available to walk through and highlight this proposal for council consideration and direction. All right. Good, good evening, council. Uh, Mayor Terry and Vice Mayor Budge and council members. Uh, Josh Wood with... Uh, Region Business, which manages uh, four different trade associations, the Region Builders, which many of you know, uh, Region Technology, uh, Region Restaurants, so all the farm to fork restaurants, and we're working hard to try to get a few of them to come here to Rancho Cordova, and now uh, Region Finance, which is our uh, community banks. Um, region Finance is really set on an ambitious goal of trying to encourage municipalities in the greater Sacramento region to invest a million dollars of existing funds into community banks and have that money be reinvested into the community. And we're asking for each of the jurisdictions in the region to play a role 
in, uh, in that policy. Uh, tonight we're asking for Rancho Cordova to join Elk Grove as some of the first adopters for the RISE policy. I first want to thank uh, your city manager, Mr. Cyrus Avar, and of course, Kim, uh, for letting us bring this proposal today, which we believe uh, is a new, safe, and innovative way uh, to maximize the existing resources that you already have to help spur the retention of jobs and expansion of jobs in our city. And I say our city because I live here, so it's awesome. Um, so tonight we're asking the council to direct staff to adopt the RISE uh, policy and allocate up to 20 million uh, of in funds, whether it's in LAFE or some other uh, investment fund or, or pot to spur economic growth. More specifically, uh, the policy would be that the city of Rancho Cordova establishes a goal and may at its discretion deposit up to 20 million of invested funds into CDs, collateralized money market accounts, ICS money, money market accounts, managed by community banks, which hit some key uh, eligibility requirements. And at the end of the day, uh, it's basically about having tax dollars stay here, making sure they're safe, maximizing these funds for economic growth and having some controls in the system for accountability. Um, and we believe it's a common sense policy approach. If you think about it, it's something kind of neat being a resident and the idea that my tax dollars, a portion of them are going to help my neighbor's business grow and those monies are cycling back to help my other neighbor's business grow and that we're basically all in this together and helping our city grow together. Um, it said uh, in the, in the uh, policy or the staff report that it, this meets and advances some of the city's goals, but I also think it uh, meets number one, which is helping promote a positive imp uh, image for Rancho Cordova because this will, real, in my opinion, really help support uh, people looking at this city as a place to do business and a place to grow their businesses. Um, I'd like to emphasize that this policy is a template um, which has been vetted. We've already uh, worked with the city of Elk Grove and they've adopted it. And we're currently in talks with a half dozen local jurisdictions whom we're expecting to do the same, hopefully within the next month or two. Um, so why is this important? We need jobs and this is a unique tool to use the existing dollars we have guarantee a rate that the city is already getting, but then have the added benefit that a large portion of those funds, at least 50%, would be reinvested into this community. To me, that's exciting, and that's a common sense and new and innovative way to use our existing funds in order to spur economic growth. As you know, the state keeps taking away different tools that you have for economic development, whether it's redevelopment or other pots of funds. And so this is a new way to basically use existing resources to do more. Um, what's important? One, tax dollars stay here, so we're tapping our existing resources. Eligible banks uh, shall be FDIC insured banks with their corporate headquarters located regionally in our recognized region, which is Sacramento, Yellow, Placer, El Dorado, so this region. And this is important because that means that the decision makers, the bank CEOs, the executives, the board members, many of the shareholders, they live here, they care about this community, and they're investing here. They know a lot of the people, uh, they have an understanding of the economy, and we believe that that means that they are even better positioned than anyone else to be the ones investing here. And they've already made that commitment to be here. Two, the tax dollars are safe. And I, I wanna emphasize this point, because um, we ne need to ensure that we get this right the first time. So these community banks must maintain, uh, to be eligible for this program, a superior rating with IDC Publishing Inc which is an independent bank evaluation entity. So what's IDC and why is it important? So IDC uh, is a industry standard for rating commercial banks. Uh, they have a quarterly financial rating, which analyzes and ranks the quality of commercial banks reporting to the FDIC and bank holding companies reporting to the Federal Reserve. So this has been in operation since 1985 and they have a CAMEL, what they call rate analysis, which analyzes capital adequacy, asset quality, margins, earning returns, and liquidity. And they have a calculation system that basically creates a ranking system. So there's several ranks within the system. Rank of one, the lowest ratios, which is a rank between two and 74. Below average, which is between 75 and 125. Average, which is 125 to 199. Excellent which is 165 to 199, but the only banks that would qualify for this program would have to be superior ranking, which is 200 and above. So to qualify, they'd have to have the superior ranking. And this is important because 
not the superior level, not the uh, excellent level, not the average level, not even below average, but 99% of the banks that fail actually fall into the lowest two categories, which were you know uh, lowest ratio or bank uh, uh, or rank of one. What does that mean? It means that the banks that are at this level are the best of the best when it comes to community banks. They have to have the superior ranking, the highest score, and they have to be headquartered here. So this is all about investing resources here, but the partners and the people who could participate have to be ones who have the strongest financials and the strongest ability to, one, perform, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also at the end of the day to guarantee the funds. So also tax dollars are maximized. Why is this? Because the banks would be agreeing to no less than 50% of the funds that are from Rancho Cordova to be spent and invested for businesses in the city and real estate ventures in the city. So this means that we will be working with you and the banks will be working with you if you do this to provide priority underwriting to business lending opportunities within the city. This means a partnership between economic development and our local banks to help spur growth. And the banks would obviously, as part of this, help promote uh, the program and help promote the city. Last piece, accountability. Each qualifying institution would submit a semi-annual report to the city manager, the treasurer, and the council members detailing loans, investments made to businesses within the city of Rancho Cordova and the projected number of jobs created. So we create a system where we're keeping dollars here. We're ensuring that those dollars are safe. We're maximizing existing resources, guaranteeing the same returns, but at the same time, investing those dollars here. And we're reporting, we have a system of accountability. If these banks aren't meeting these requirements, there's other banks that are in line. We have you know, about a dozen uh, community banks which meet this criteria, and uh, we think that they will all want to compete for this type of business. So why wouldn't we want to keep our tax dollars here? We ask you to adopt RISE and ensure that our tax dollars stay here, they're safe, they're maximized for economic growth, and that they're accountable. Okay. Questions for uh, the presenter or staff? Okay, I, I had a couple. Um, so, well, I, I actually, I, I have some suggestions, I guess, for staff as, as far as we implement it. So, are there any other questions first? How did Everybody? Elk Grove do it? So, didn't they do it where they... Um, they didn't adopt something from council. They suggested a, a staff does it, correct? Yes. Yeah, so Elk Grove, every city has a different process, and I always learn that um, uh, and reminded of that often. Um, Elk Grove uh, didn't actually bring it to the council. They have an audit committee, which is comprised of two council members. So uh, Vice Mayor Steve Detrick and Pat Hume comprised the audit committee. They looked at the language and basically just directed staff to do it. Our recommendation today would be that the council would – uh, direct staff to adopt the, the policy and principle, and then we would work with staff on all the details as far as um, how to work it out from here. Cyrus, uh, can I ask Cyrus a question? Cyrus, is that the way? If you did, if we did something of this policy, you would prefer it? Well, it's the wish of the council ultimately. But uh, if the council's desire is for this to be administered at staff level, we have the capacity and the capability to do so. Tr traditionally, something like this, where you would where we would end up moving funds has always been at a staff decision. Okay. At, at the, for where it ends up being, it, once we adopt a policy of how much in reserves or things like that, but where they choose to, to have the, the contracts, we would vote on it usually in consent, like, okay, we're opening an account here, but it wouldn't be something that would normally So we don't have to bring it council. back and have the council do it. We just say, we give them, this is the direction we want, and then... So no, I, I think when we get to the point of moving the funds, there would be something probably put on consent, but that would be. So just a clarification. So our, our existing investment policy does allow us to make these types of investments. And so moving funds, if the council were to direct staff to move in this direction, we could begin to work with a local bank or local banks to move those funds under our existing in investment policy. Okay, let me, let me make sure I understand. We're going to take money from a bank that we don't get, that doesn't invest in our community, put it into one of our local banks that lives in our community, get 
of that money is going to be reinvested back into our small businesses in our community. And it doesn't take really too much, uh, really adjustment from basically everything. So it's pretty simple. We just take the money out of one and put it into a local bank. Is that correct? And then they report back to us how they've invested into our community. I would say I think the only uh, item that for clarification would be the 50% of the loans. I don't believe it's specified for small, you said small businesses, and I believe there's a variety of businesses that would qualify under that, under this so um, scenario. Just, so. But rancho businesses. I believe that's how it's Absolutely. engineered to work. Well, and we can give directions too, and I have some comments around that. Uh, so right. well, but to clarify something, these funds right now are not at a bank. No, they're, they're a part of, a, there's a state investment co pool called LAIF, Local Agency Investment Fund. It's uh, operated and managed by a group of individuals at the state of California, and it's just a tool that many local agencies use to invest funds. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. What has LAIF ever done for Rancho? Oh, I think it's, it's mainly an investment tool. It's an investment tool, and the notion was to earn a rate of investment that was not otherwise achievable by investing at a local bank. This program is proposing to pay a LAIF rate, but that's not something that has been standard part for the course. So the so LAIF investments could be the kinds of things you read about in the paper that are invested all over the world and sometimes end up being controversial. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know which ones you're referring to, and I'm not sure off but, I mean, they could be ones. LAIF could be investing all over the world. It's a it's a I, fund I just like any other. It's mutual an investment fund, fund right. but I don't I can't say specifically what their investments is off, are offhand. Okay, but okay, so so maybe um, we know PERS invest invests all over. Uh, this would, so so this is the same. Leaf is basically the same kind of thing. Well, Le Leaf is subject to different. PERS has the ability to invest in a variety of different instruments, whereas Leaf has more limitations as well into what they can invest funds into because it is city tax dollars that they're holding. Okay. So there is different investment criteria that they're following. Insured investments, things like that. Correct. Right, which this would be as well. So this would allow us to go back to our citizens our, and our businesses and ranchers and say we're going to basically put $4.5 million of investment back into the community? Is that basically what we're saying? Well, the, the balance right now of our LATH funds is about $9, nine million. million. Yeah. So that means 50% would then be available to all us business owners. Not me, but everyone else. Dang it. <laughs> I would also like to uh, submit my resignation today to go get 4.5 million. I'm sorry, just joking. Bob, do you have a question? No, oh, okay. Um, so Thanks. just a, a couple of... Oh, David, go ahead. A uh, question for Kim. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, security? You know, is there any securitization difference between city dollars sitting in the lay fund versus city dollars sitting in a community bank? The investment tools that are being proposed here are collateralized, and there's a variety. And so, like I said, they are there are different mechanisms, but they are all permitted investments under our investment code, which our investment policy, which means that they meet the criteria for collateralization that we require for security. And I don't know if there's any further expansion you'd like to do on that. Are you asking uh, about yeah, insurance? Yeah, yeah, I mean, whatever the risk is that we subject ourselves to of being part of life, how does this option compare to that? I mean, I, these would all be FDIC insured investments, so that's a quarter of a million in insurance. Um, Which is very, yeah, limited for our point of view. Right, I mean, and and using the rating system that they're talking about means that you're probably not, we're not playing with the ones that are on edge, but then again, Moody's and Fitch did a bang up job back in 08 and before. Um, Jerry and I might have worked for some of them back in the. Actually, I did work for the, the biggest one that failed. Um, but I, I'm not sure what the fund looks like too. But in most funds, there, there's you run the risk of your of your asset losing value, and your investments losing value. Which in this case, they wouldn't unless there was a failure of the bank. Um, and I think just as a follow-up, if, if council were to direct staff to continue moving forward and evaluating this, those are the types of discussions as we get into more detailed discussions with the member banks that we would be having to before moving forward with a specific agreement. Because in order for, for the city to move forward with this proposal, we would have to enter into an agreement with specific member banks. Okay. 
to participate. So those are all things that we would be doing as we move down the road, if that is the direction. Yeah. Provided. So if we're, ma- if we're making a list of things to consider, obviously that's one of them. Correct. We have to prove to our taxpayers that we're keeping their dollars as safe as we were in the other alternative. Yes. Can, can I ask a quick question for, um, can I pose it to economic development since he's in the room? Sure. That's you, Kurt. We'll go ahead and ask the question. Okay. Um, how does something like this help out the community of the business, the business community, to have some uh, type of mechanism to help fund? Thank you, Council Members. Kurt Haven, Director of Economic Development. Um, I think that to be able to say that we are investing in our community is a strong, good economic development tool. Um, but not being in the banking business um, and talking to a lot of businesses out there, money is tight. Um, this doesn't mean that they will qualify for a loan sooner or quicker or more efficiently. It just means there's more capital to spend. So probably most of the issues are is money's tight because of government regulations and the amount of equity that they need to carry to receive the loan. So it's a, you know, it'd be a good partnership, but it's not going to solve everyone's borrowing capacity. But it's good to know that our money's in our in our city. Is that a good answer? It's close. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think actually, uh, Jerry Leg with Five Star Bank is here, and I think he could answer a lot of these questions dealing with uh, collateralization, which would uh, get to Councilmember Sanders' questions, and then as far as. Um, the rate, which I think, you know, we've talked, you know, the letter talks about LAIF, but there's other funds that are, that the LAIF rate that we're basically saying that these banks can do are beating right now. So there is the ability for the city to do 20 million. So I uh, just want to close with that and just thank you for your consideration. Thank right. Jerry, I have some questions for you too. Um, so one, and you and I talked about this last week, last week? Uh, no. The other night. Yeah. 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 Thursday little, night. That's right. Um, so one question I had is um, the, the proposal says to match LATH. Mm-hmm. Um, I would envision that there'd be a way to do this in RFP and see what banks would quote us back for rates. But you were saying that there, you had some concerns about that. Right. Yeah. My name's Jerry Legg. I'm the head of government banking for Five Star Bank. I previously worked at the state treasurer's office um, and dealt with LATH every single day. Um, so my concern with trying to have it as an RFP process is that let's say you had six banks apply and then you start getting into a bidding war and somebody says, okay, we'll match LAIF plus five basis points or 1.19% right now. But yet with Elk Grove, we're only giving them the LAIF rate. And then let's say city of Sacramento comes and says, well, we want LAIF plus 10. Well, then do we come back and see Branch of Cordova and say, oh, sorry, we have to give you five basis points more. So I think that's the problem is you don't want to be chasing rates. With government funds, the three priorities in state law are safety, then liquidity, then yield. And what you're looking at here is a program that's not only going to provide that safety of your funds, it's going to give you more liquidity than what the city currently has. And it's going to give you actually a net rate higher than LAIF because LAIF charges fees and the banks in this program will not. So you're going to actually come out ahead. Some other differentiations here are that LAIF pays you interest on a quarterly basis. The banks in the RISE program are going to pay you on a monthly basis. So your money is going to compound more frequently than you would get from LAIF. In terms of the security, as Councilman Sander was asking, The funds at the local agency investment fund are protected by the full faith of the state of California. So there's no insurance on it. There has been court cases during some of the past recessions about are those funds accessible during a recession? Can the state withhold those? No, they cannot. So they're on demand just like a bank account. But your funds in the banks in the RISE proposal are collateralized. You have the FDIC insurance up to $250,000. Anything above that, we have to pledge at least 110% collateral securities held by a third party so that if something were to happen to the bank, that security can be liquidated by the FDIC and returned to the depositors. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
my other question, and thank you, Jerry. Um, interest rates. I was just gonna, I guess, ask what your yours or Josh or, or or Kim's reaction would be to not only the IDC ratings but also incorporating a CRA rating um, score as far as part of the criteria. Um, so that's the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and then specifically, I, I wanted to see, and again, as I would like to see an RFP as part of the process. I'm not as concerned about the return because in this interest rate environment, nobody's making anything when it comes to interest rates. Um, but goals around SBA lending and specifically around um, working with our revolving loan fund. Um, so if that's X amount, I, I know, I think Elk Grove focused it more and a lot of the banks are talking more about real estate loans. I'm far less interested in that and I'm more interested in job creating loans. So how many, and, and, and taking into account the activities of these banks in the SBA world. So how many SBA loans have they been doing and would they commit within our, within our city? Um, cause to me that those are way more valuable to what we're trying to build in a city than, you know, if somebody's going to go and finance Lennar's next subdivision, which someone's going to finance Lennar's next subdivision. We don't really need to worry about that nearly as much as, as, you know, investments into small, into small businesses and growing businesses, even if that's middle to, to larger businesses. Um, so I'd like to see that as part of it. I, Jerry, I get your answer about the interest rates. I still would like if we could get paid more than Elk Grove. I don't, you know, I've, I've sat on the other side with, with you in, in this world as a bank. And so I get the, the hard part, but it's also our money. Um, and I would say we would start with the lathe funds of nine, whatever million and move the entire amount. Um, so I'm not sure where you're, you're getting the 50%. I mean, we could move the entire amount if we chose to. Um, and if that's among two or three banks and they make commitments of so much, you know, within let's say three years and we get, I don't what did you say? Quarterly, we were, we were going to get reports on lending activities. Was that the, was that the commitment of the program? Um, every so six months. is it ever so twice? So biannually. And so I would say we probably revisit that annually to decide if we're getting, if, if we're to hold, at least to hold the banks accountable if they're not producing the, the commitments that they had made. And also that they would also make a CRA commitment around investments in lending. And so that would be financing or lending to community facilities, low-income housing tax credits, revolving loan funds, CDFIs, CDCs, that would benefit the city. That may be a stretch for some regional and community banks. I, I get that because a lot of them don't have that the capacity for that. So if that if that becomes an issue as we're going through the process, that that's not something that a lot of them can, can commit to, that's something I get because that's usually the larger, more complex banks that have the resources to do some of those things. Um, but I'd be interested in seeing if there if there were commitments that regional banks and community banks wanted to make in that in that realm. So, Mr. Mayor, are you suggesting CRA like ratings and SBA like ratings? Because those two don't not necessarily seem compatible. Actually, they they both do the same thing. So, your SBA loans count towards your CRA ratings and your CRA goals, um, and so so one is we look at the IDC rating and the CRA rating. So if we have, if we have a, a, let's say, let's say we have a high IDC rated bank, but they're satisfactory when it comes to CRA, that's probably not somebody that we would necessarily put at the top of the heap. We'd want to go for somebody that's triple outstanding in, in the three or is outstanding in their CRA rating, right? Um, but you so, want to dial that down just to Rancho Cordova as opposed to the region? Well, no. So in the RFP process, you would look at it as far as how they run their bank in general and assume that if we put investments there, that we're investing in a bank that has a history of reinvesting in the communities that they take deposits in. That's what your CRA rating is for, is that wherever you're taking deposits in a community, you're reinvesting them by doing loans and have and and uh, extending capital within the community. That, that it's that just a very deposits. broad definition of community under CRA. No. It, the CRA rating gets is a review of the practice of the, how the bank runs itself. So again, if we put more deposits there, they should then in turn be investing within the community. The SBA loans and even CRA loans, again, a, a lot of banks when they go through mergers, 
um, some of the larger banks usually, but even regional community banks do this, is they will make CRA goals and commitments, usually in negotiation with an advocacy group like Greenlining or the California Reinvestment Coalition. They'll make commitments to a state, to certain counties, to certain areas that they're going to bank. Usually as part of a merger, they may take over an area in a, um, in a county that they haven't banked before, and they'll say, we're going to make a goal of this many CRA loans and, and qualified loans um, within the community. So what I'm saying is, is that as part of an RFP, we would ask banks to say, okay, if you give us $5 million, we're going to commit to at least five SBA loans a year of at least a million dollars. Uh, some, some along those lines, that, that's what I'm trying to get at. So it would be making a commitment in the city around those types of loans. Right. What, what, but, is, what does a CRA loan have to do with small business? Small business loans are CRA loans. Oh, they are? Yeah. So the SBA loans, so what's the difference between SBA and CRA? I still don't get it. It's, it sounds CRA, like the same Community thing. Community Investment Act loans could also be um, low-income housing. Uh, so um, um, extend, a extending a, a, a loan, loan to a... Um, to a low-income home buyer. It could be financing Mather Veterans Village. It could be financing a community facility, um, you know, building Fulls Cordova Community Partnership, a new facility, Local things facilities. like that. So there's a lot, there's a bunch of different ways to, to get to your CRA goal. And there's, there's a whole bunch of different things that they rate you on within the CRA. I thought they had to do 50% of them. The, the 50% was the money that they had to reinvest back in it to us. So wouldn't that be the commitment to the SBA or is that not? No, because you, you could do, so an SBA loan is to a small business. Right. Right. So if in, from what I understand of Elk Grove's program, and if I'm wrong, fine, but it was more focused on, or at least the banks are making commitments around real estate loans. So if you extend a loan to Lennar to build a thousand units in Ranch Cordova, that's not a CRA investment. So I, what I'm saying is all SBA loans count towards your CRA goal. So those would all be those are the kinds of loans that I think we care more about than some of the other ones. Josh, so um, the Elk Grove hearing. It, what, so no, it wasn't about uh, residential loans. Um, so the discussion in Elk Grove. Well, no, in, 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 my, with, in my excuse me, in my example of Lennar, that would be that that's a commercial loan. It's just not a CRA related in any way loan. Yeah, yeah I, I get what you're saying as far as that piece. But I mean, is, is what Elk Grove wanted the ability for is if they wanted to recruit X restaurant to come to Elk Grove and they need to do an expansion, they didn't want to rule out the ability for them to build out a larger building or to do a TI mm -hmm. or to buy a facility. So I, I, as long as we're kind of safeguarding for that. The other thing is, is I'm hoping that because these banks are already committing to a higher standard than everybody else, that if you're going to make the CRA requirements and some of these other requirements additional beyond what we're asking for for these banks, then maybe we should be looking at the banks in, and the investment funds that the city already has funds in who aren't matching this high of a rate, who aren't committing to any of these CRA requirements. Because at this point, what these banks are, are committing to do is match a rate or beat a rate that you guys have on a lot of the investments and already invest over 50% back into the community and prove up on it. So in my opinion, I, I understand uh, the direction of some of your comments and what, what you're saying. Uh, the commitment is already there and above and beyond. And what we're basically doing is using the talent that we have here to invest here. And that, and that commitment being in writing and being willing to do that annual, that semi-annual report and prove up on it, I think is a pretty large commitment. Yeah, no, I, it is. So, I, 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 um, my comment, so whether it's a 50% or if it's even more, if there are banks that want to make those commitments, that's, that's what I would want to put into an RFP process. And again, when I say CRA, one is that beyond the IDC, so these are kind of two different things I'm, I'm talking about. One is their current rating for CRA, that we wouldn't place money with a bank that has been rated poorly when it comes to, to CRA. The other one would be, instead of just saying that any loan would count towards that 50%, that it would be things that are related either to CRA or SBA as the loan. Okay, so, but from my perspective, if we look at, if we step back and look at the concept, this is a really significant thing to do, all right? Because any way you look at it, 
uh, uh, and we've all talked about this for years, we have all heard how the Sacramento region is lacking in the angel investor community that you see in other cities in California or all over the United States. Everywhere we've gone, people have complained about this. So from my perspective, this is our opportunity to use our own local dollars to grow our own angel investors who then turn around and invest in our community. But I completely agree you know, and, and, and I, quite frankly, I feel uh, fortunate that you haven't yet used an acronym that I didn't understand. <laughs> however. Um, I could try, but. <laughs> yeah, I know you did. Um, however, <laughs> um, at this point, it's probably more important that we just express the goals that we would like to have staff put into this agreement if, if that can be worked out and then report back to us on how it's, how it's going. Um, because obviously, I, I suspect every one of us really does want to invest in local companies, those local small businesses. Diane just said 70%, 75% or something of chamber members are local small business. And I realize the federal definition of small business can be quite large. But on the other hand, you know, local small business. Um, our economic development department is working really hard to get a hacker lab established here in Rancho Cordova or the maker spaces that you're talking about. And so those are the kinds of um, local facilities that start to uncover the people with the good ideas who need some help. You know, once somebody has vetted it and decided that this is really a, a good business that should go forward, or as Josh says, um, look at the number of times that we've tried to get X restaurant who had to close up because of the, the G1C construction and, and we wanted them to come here, but they went someplace else, you know. Okay, so um, it gives us another, we always talk about the tools in the toolbox. It would give us another tool that we could use to either grow local business or to intrigue other business that exists and needs a new location or an opportunity to expand to come here. As we have done those Metro Chamber business walks, every one of us has, has run into somebody who was doing something phenomenal and we didn't know anything about it. I'll never forget that Mike and I went over here to the, the um, large building and, and found this guy who, who is Chinese, he's a Chinese professor and he's invented some phenomenal new uh, talent for solar panels that gives them a, a long-term capacity that they didn't have before. You know, those are the kinds of things that we could potentially look at investing with the goal that they do create jobs. That's the idea. Grow our business, add to our business community, create more jobs. And having our own angel investment firm seems like a logical way to try to do that. And again, my comments or my suggestions, um, I think they, they complement the proposal in a lot of ways. But I think what's really important is even if they create jobs, there's a level at which most banks would do that loan. And what I'm talking about is incentivizing or asking the banks to compete amongst each other for the, for the loans that are harder to do that are less likely to have gotten done. Um, and that's when you talk about CRA and SBA and a lot of, I mean, there's a reason that the SBA has to insure all of these loans. They're higher risk. And we've had our own experience in the last year around a business that, you know, used all the SBA that they, that they could, and then we gave them another loan and it didn't work out. And that's the risk you run when you invest in, in, in small businesses and businesses that are trying to, to grow. Um, but it, Again, if we added, I think, those components, I would be very comfortable with it. And again, the IDC, I think it, it, it's a great rating. Um, but adding something in that also, and I, Jerry, I don't know, does the I, IDC doesn't take into account a CRA rating. It's, no, it's but, liquidity and, and, no, and safety and soundness rating. California government code requires, in order to get any public deposits, you have to have a CRA rating of at least um, satisfactory. Right? Satisfactory. Yeah. So in order to get a deposit, from any municipality, a bank has to have that. And as Josh mentioned, you may already be banking with a bank that does not currently have that rating. Mm -hmm. 
Another consideration that Josh mentioned and that Kim was mentioning earlier is when you're looking at your investment portfolio, if you go out longer on the yield curve right now in a, raising, a rising interest rate environment, the rate that you're getting from LAIF or that you could get, be getting from RISE is going to surpass many of those investments. Currently, what we pay on the money market account that we would be paying for RISE is higher than 14 investments in your portfolio. Yeah. And that's going to continue to go up because the Federal Reserve is expected to increase rates next month and then three times in 2018. So that's another consideration when you ask about, well, can we, can we get a little more? You're looking at rate increases every single month for the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah, I would totally agree with that guidance. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I, I love the idea. I just, I think um, adding that component, and again, the CRA rating, it does not speak to the city. It speaks to the MSA, which is the four county region, but it, it gives you an idea of which ones even care about that rating comparatively, which is really, really important. Because if you're again, it, if you're not a bank that's looking to buy another bank, there's very little motivation to have a high CRA rating. So if we're looking at the banks that are more responsible to their communities, it's probably better. And you're right, there is that issue with other banks that we do business with now that don't have that rating. But I would say that at a minimum, they should be outstanding, not satisfactory. Well, this looks like a, in concept, a win-win-win to me. Absolutely. So you get a win because it's secure, you get better earnings, even if slight. Uh, it's a win because you have local reinvestment. And it's a win because these banks are also predominantly locally owned. So it's not as if profits from the banking activity that we're assisting here is being shifted off to some other market. Odds are a lot of it will stay in this community because the banks are community banks. So the the one question I have, Josh, is uh, Elk Grove did also this 50% rate. That's the the model you're, yes, you're proposing. Right. So let's say we put $10 million in this, this model. Um, that means that it has to be a $5 million local investment. So one business owner locally says, I need to do a $5 million expansion. He does that in year one. It's a 10-year loan. So is our 10 million then collateralized? Is the need met for 10 years while he pays off his $5 million note? No, the, the, uh, that would be, it'd be annually. Uh, but So let's say, for example, let's use a different number. If you did 20 million, that would mean that each year, 10 million invested in the community. It's a big impact. So it's not just 50%, really. It's 50% multiplied every year. And again, if we revisited that annually and we didn't That's have somebody meeting it, then we would go back out to RFP for it. Extraordinarily yeah. substantial mm -hmm. investment. It would be interesting to know how much banking activity is already happening in Rancho Dove with applicant banks. In other words, would they have to change anything or do anything in order to meet the needs of the program? Five Star Bank currently has $17 million in loans in Rancho Cordova. So without any deposits from the city, we've already done over $17 million, and that's just our bank. There's all the other community banks that could also give numbers such as that. So this is only going to increase the lending activity and the economic development within the city. And that's more information I just received right there than I've ever received from one of our giant banks about what activity is going on in Ranch Cordova. That's for sure. Well, it sounds to me like this, most of you are going much faster than I think of these things. I can, I understand most of them, but just one thing that seems to me is that what Linda was talking about, about Sacramento is not, doesn't have the uh, um, look forward on what other cities are doing, and they say, well, Sacramento missed this one, and Sacramento missed that. If we're put, going to put some money into something along this line, then it'll give us a chance to bring in some businesses that are skipping Sacramento because they're not doing what we're talking about doing right now. Yep. Can I ask a question? Why do we cut it off on 20 if we're making higher returns on our investments? Well, I think we were talking about lathe funds to begin with, and that's not twenty million. That's nine point. What'd you say? Nine point three. Nine point three million. So there's other funds that are getting different returns. That so I think the so here the the, the first bite at the apple was looking at our lathe funds. So it, would it be something along the lines if the if we look at it and 
six months and it's making more higher returns, would we move the money that isn't making those higher returns into it to help keep reinvesting in our city? There's nothing that would prevent us from doing that. Oh, awesome. That I know. You're going to have 50 million. <laughs> Cyrus, do you have anything? You started to talk up a couple of times. <laughs> do we have any public comment? No. No. Okay. Cyrus? No, I think it's uh, just my point is um, I wanted to make sure that we're clear on the direction from the council. I think uh, I just want to reiterate what I'm hearing from the council and make sure that we, uh, as we move ahead with the implementation of the program, this is a program that will either match or beat uh, the life rate. It would um, have 50% reinvestment in the community. But I did also hear that with a focus on um, SBA and, and CRA uh, type loans and with the goal of job creation. So if that's the criteria, we need to have some clear metrics. So as, as we move ahead with the implementation, we know exactly what we're measuring. As stated by the representative from Five Star Bank, if Five Star Bank is, has already invested $17 million in the community, would that investment count towards their community investment or is this some additional reinvestments that they would have to make. I think it's going to be new annual activity under the proposal. Right. right. So those are the kind of clarifications that we need from the council before we move ahead with the implementation. I also did hear from uh, the mayor uh, that there, there is a desire to do an RFP. We need clear direction from the council if this is the wish of the council to, to do this through an RFP process or this is um, a negotiation discussions with individual banks. So Donald did also say that if it becomes an issue with the CRA and the SBA, that, that we wouldn't go with that. But if it's not an issue, then we're going to do that, right? If the banks all back away from our deal, then we'd want to do, then we'd be okay with just looking at them saying 50%. Is that basically what you're saying? Um, yeah, my suggestion would be, well, one is, to Jerry's point, already we can't, it sounds like we can't invest in anybody that's satisfactory or below in CRA. Uh, or I'm sorry. Below satisfactory, um, I would just add that we should only be considering outstanding CRA banks. Do we have to do our own rating because it'd be Rancho? We want to look for no, what no, 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 no. In our city. No, you would use their rating right. the, oh, okay. that they're already getting from the Federal Reserve, the FDIC. None of them at this size are the OCC. Um, so you would have that. that rating and then ask them to make commitments or goals around those. Okay, so I'm wondering... RFP may not be the appropriate tool. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it really sounds more like we're asking for a request for qualifications. That yes, as opposed to an RFP. Yes, we're asking for an RFQ. Yes. Does that sound better in the banking world? Yeah, that's more accurate. Because that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that those things that you the three things that you identified um, goals of safety, liquidity, and yield, and you need to know that in terms of their um, uh, financial strength and portfolio and all of the things that are applicable to this project. Correct. You would get an application from each bank that's willing to participate along with their IDC quarterly report, uh, the rate that they're proposing to pay, which would be LAIF, um, and then the guarantee that they're going to report at least semi-annually on the loan development as well as the number of jobs created. One point of um, clarification I might suggest to council, if you require an outstanding CRA rating for whoever applies, you may not get that many applications because getting an outstanding rating is somewhat difficult, especially for community banks. And that's what we're looking at is community banks that are headquartered within the four county region here. So again, for those that aren't familiar, getting a CRA rating of outstanding is that they've got a very high amount of loans in low to moderate income areas and uh, a lot of s small business association loans, administration loans, which you know we have our whole SBA department is located here in Rancho Cordova, but some of the other community banks that may be looking to participate may not be able to have that same kind of background. So in order to give everyone a fair shot, you may want to consider just asking for a satisfactory and above, and then you can choose who you feel is the best representatives for those deposits. Well, in terms of community reinvestment, I mean, not, not to use the acronym, but in terms of pure community reinvestment, 
it would seem that staff, it would be more appropriate for staff to have the opportunity to, um, um, to review that portfolio and see whether it really meets more of an internal definition of community reinvestment as opposed to um, some static rating sheet of some sort. I mean, you, you know, if, if, if they've got 17 million invested in Rancho Cordova, then, and somebody else doesn't, then obviously that ends up being a higher score. Well, and for us personally, not for, not necessarily for some state or federal rating agency. Right. Well, and Jerry, to your point, um, mm -hmm. for the outstanding rating, if, if that dropped the number of possible participants to such low levels that that's an issue, then that's something that I, we could take off the table. But I, I think we would start with, can we get good, good uh, applicants at that level? Um, and then, Jerry, really to your point, um, the fact that, you know, Five Star has a robust team here that's doing SBA would rank you higher than other ones that didn't. And just because they have a good CRA rating, if they don't have the presence in the community to execute on a commitment like X amount of SBA loans, that would mean that the ones that do have a branch here, people here on, on the ground are more likely to actually do those loans than someone that says, well, you know, I'm headquartered in Roseville and that's where my SBA team is and we're gonna, we'll try to do some stuff in your city, right? So the potential is probably not there. The other thing I, I think we should probably put in there too from an economy of scale is that if we're talking 9 million, we shouldn't even consider parking less than 4 million in any one institution. So if, I mean, if we're putting a million or 2 million or something like that, the bang for your buck and, and the scale at which you could, you could use that. So, I mean, to me, like for 9 million, we're looking at two banks at most to do this, not Everyone's get a half, everyone gets a half a million for 10 of them no, or something like I, that. that. Yeah, that's, that's not logical. So headquarters in our bank right now, uh, I mean, not bank, headquarters in our city right now, I believe we only have one American River, American River Bank. Yeah. What is their, are, are they, because that's the kind of people we want to, they're headquartered in our city. They're our bank, they're Rancho's bank. So is that someone we would we would be able to? I, I'm it concerned. would be eligible. The, the point know, is that they would need to be headquartered within the four county region, right? And if they had just a good, but they're based in Rancho, that's that's a double win. It's a band, Rancho bank that gets the money and then loans to other businesses. How does that work? So it, again, it speaks to the um, the concept of letting staff mm -hmm. decide what the. What, what our internal evaluation system would look like as opposed to just relying solely on a static, yeah. uh, some uh, outside static agency's rating. Okay. Do you guys have a recommendation for minimum investment in a particular financial organization? Well, you currently, um, as the mayor mentioned, you have 9.3 million in LAFE, and that's what you were looking at. If you're looking at that dollar amount to start with, um, as he mentioned, using two banks, that would be about four and a half million per bank. And that'll give you a lot of ammunition to go out and do a lot of loans, as opposed to if you had nine banks, a million dollars each, somebody could chew that up with one loan or two loans. So you may not get as much bang for the buck. Um, so I would agree that depending on how much money you allocate to this, whether it's just the LAFE money or additional funds in the future that there's at least four, $5 million per bank in order to get a sufficient number of loans. That's a reasonable size. Exactly. Yeah. Keep in mind that some of the SBA loans can go up to $5 million. So even that, if you do one SBA loan, you could do it all in one loan. Mm -hmm. um, but what Which we would, would be great if it was that kind of loan. It would be great. And you could get a lot of jobs, but could you also get a lot of jobs if you did ten five hundred thousand dollar loans? So, yes, you could. Exactly. <laughs> yes, you could. Yeah, and the smaller For dollar sakes, amounts. Yes, you could. Yeah, and the smaller dollar amounts tend to produce more jobs. Than You'll see a lot growth. faster growth with yep. those smaller yep. businesses. And again, that that's why, as as we look at the just saying fifty percent, while it sounds nice. The hook would be what kinds of loans they're doing for the 50%. That was a question I was about to ask. You know, do we have a real internal priority 
about what kind of lending we prefer. Right. I mean, for example, lending to a homeowner north of International, uh, west of Sunrise, to upgrade their home. That's a priority for us to see that sort of reinvestment. But would, should we consider this, should that activity be considered for this fund, or should it only be small business? And if it is small business, what is small business? Is it about growth, reinvestment? Is it about automation autom automation of some kind? Automation of some kind? Um, you know how you, how you would measure the quality of a loan. That's what I'm getting at. And what sort of lending is most valuable to us as a city? Right. I think that's a question we You're have not, to answer. We're not talking humdur. I'm sorry. I won't use that that, that term. <laughs> uh, we're not talking mortgage and, no, and this, consumer lending no, at this, all in this, right? No, this but is apartment, economic apartment, development, business multifamily. Loans. You could, you could, yes, you could count that. Towards just to make one that comment. Could, that could be reportable, but Honda stuff would not. I think, I think at the end of the day, the, the, pro, the profile of the investments that the city wants is something that the city staff and the council should figure out. Uh, to put it in perspective, the city of Elk Grove put $15 million that they committed for the program, but they also did say that they wanted the ability for home loans or any types of loans. They just wanted to see the money come to the community. So every city has different priorities. So theirs was totally unrestricted. They, we actually came to them with a proposal that was more restricted, and they wanted to open it up to other types of loans. Interesting. Interesting. So I think there's a lot of good conversation here. I think there's been some suggestions that I, I'm not hearing a lot of opposition to any of the oh. kind of changes. So, um, so well, hang on. Um, so besides that, I'd like to move this forward and I'll ask for a motion in a sec. Um, what might be helpful if if there's an interest in having a, a subcommittee to look at this before it goes out instead, instead of bringing it back to the entire council, because I don't I don't think we need to rehash this again. Um, I'd be happy to serve on it because with my experience in finance and banking, is there somebody else that would like to serve on that committee to take a look at what goes out? Well, it should be David or Garrett. And actually, I would have suggested that the two of them do it. You guys want to do it? Okay, so are we ready for a motion? Go ahead. All right. So I will move that we adopt the principles of RISE, uh, at, uh, uh, the RISE proposal, and ask state staff to negotiate the program um, based on the kinds of issues that we've been discussing. Uh, the definition of small business, uh, whether or not, I think uh, Cyrus just uh, listed these, whether or not to uh, meet or beat the LAFE rate, the 50% locally investment, creating jobs, going out for an RFQ, um, limiting it to new annual activity, and um, developing an internal criteria that uh, um, that expresses the goals of this program for Rancho Cordova, and that we appoint uh, Garrett and David to be the subcommittee that works with staff to do this. I just, before we um, go for a vote, uh, Kim, is there any other specific information that you would like to have included in this motion? No, I think we're good. Okay. Okay, so I have a motion, do I have a second? Need a second. Second. Oh, so close. Uh, I have a motion by Budge and a second by Gatewood. Second by Gatewood? Oh, I think all three you said it at the same time. Third second. Third second. Roll call, please. Council Member Gatewood? Aye. Council Member Sander? I'll follow up my second with an aye. <laughs> Council Member McGarvey? Aye. Vice Mayor Budge? Yes. Mayor Terry? Aye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So with that, we'll move on to 12.2, and I don't think Kim's gonna be going very far for our employee home loan program. 12.3. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, 12.3, thank you. It's so late, I'm starting to lose track. <laughs> Honorable Mayor, members of the council, uh, this item is being brought forward to council for consideration based on the request of council at the last council meeting on November 6th. Um, staff was directed to look, bring forward ideas for establishing an employee home loan or down payment assistance program for staff to purchase a primary residence in the city of Rancho Cordova. 
there are several programs already out there in various jurisdictions that have employee home loan programs. And so uh, the research that was done was essentially looking at some of those other programs out there and identifying some of the criteria that was consistent f across those programs and those various agencies. So the bullet points in the staff report are really just some criteria and suggestions uh, based on those other programs that are being put out there to find receive further direction from the council of whether or not this is the type of program um, that is envisioned and what the interest and reaction is to these. So as a, I could walk through these um, to start and just so we can uh, follow up with a discussion on that. So the thought is that this program would be available for only full-time staff employed directly by the city of Rancho Cordova. One idea, one proposal, which is consistent with just how some of the agencies operate, is that the loan would be capped at a certain dollar amount, so throw out $50,000 or 18% of the purchase price of the home, whichever is less. Uh, typically, most of the programs do have some sort of cap, both percentage and dollar amount that this, the uh, residence being purchased by the employee would have to be a primary residence. It could not be a second home or a rental property or anything like that. That if the home were sold or any type of transfer of interest were to, to occur, that that loan would then become pay, uh, due to the city. Similarly, if the employee were to no longer be employed by the city, that loan would then be called and would have to be repayable within one year of separation. Again, this is just criteria being thrown out there for some suggestions and feedback. Uh, the proposed interest rate was 3% annually. Payments of interest made through payroll deductions and many of these programs are interest-only payments for the first five or 10 years of the loan program. And then after that first five or 10 years, uh, payments of interest in principle are, starting, are collected. Many of these are amortized on either 25 or 30-year loans uh, schedules. Some of these programs have tried to incentivize staff um, to refinance those loans after a certain time period, such as 15 years, to encourage staff to start paying down those loans. And so one idea is a uh, possible balloon payment at the end of 15 years to encourage that refinance. Second deed of trust, that's just a um, more criteria. Employee could pay off the loan at any time with no prepayment penalty. Overall, most programs like this have a cap that the total amount of the loans outstanding cannot exceed a certain amount of the overall city investment portfolio. So uh, $2 million is just thrown out as a number for consideration. And then finally, that the property would have to be, if the property were to be purchased with a city home loan, it would have to be uh, inspected by a city building inspector and if there are code violations to be found it would have to be rectified within one year of purchase so those are just some criteria that were found when looking at other programs and other agencies questions for staff i know i have a handful care for staff and everybody else so we really have the gumption to foreclose on employees that we've let go of we're really going to do that uh, that, no, and you and honestly, that would be kind of the dumbest thing we'd ever do. If you were in second position on a house mm -hmm. and they weren't in compliance, and we foreclosed and there wasn't enough equity, the city wouldn't get their money back. So that's usually a very unwise thing for a second lender to ever do. Usually, you ask them to perform. There are things you could do to do that, but it's more that they would have to refinance or start making payments. And I, I have a, a suggestion when we get to that point too about how we would address it uh, as opposed to the balloon payment or if they moved. I had a, a, just a quick comment. I think some of the things that um, Kim mentioned have to do with making sure that any program criteria is strong enough um, so that the city is not in a situation where someone could say we're making a gift of public funds. You know, we have to make sure there's a, a public benefit and not just a private benefit. Right. So a lot of cities have all these types of things to kind of be able to stand behind that. Right. It's a traditional tool for a lender, but these types of loans, it's very rare for them to do what you were just suggesting. 
Linda, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kim, on the second page, the third point down, that you're not asking for payment on principal until after the end of the fifth year. Um, it seems that during all the foreclosure crisis during the recession, that those are the kinds of loans that got people into, into trouble most often and most quickly. So I'm not sure why that seems like a good idea. So that would be the first question. The second question is it, it feels like there's a contradiction between the next two bullets. How can you, how can you talk about 25 years in one bullet and then talk about the loan being due in 15 years in the next bullet? So one is referring to how the payment would be amortized, and so it would be amortized over a 25-year window. So the, the loan in that scenario, the loan would not be paid off in full in a 15 within 15 years. It would be paid down to some degree, and the thought is with the with the pay down on the first and also the second, that after 15 years, the homeowner would be in a position to refinance those two loans. But it says the balance of the loan, original loan amount less principal payments, is due at the end of 15 years from date of origination. Oh, OK. And then you say that that's an option. but. Again, either it's paid off in 25 years or it's paid off in 15 years. So and the way these programs have worked in other agencies is that the homeowner is paying the first, and so they're reducing their principal on their first over those 15 years. And then they start reducing the principal on the second over the next. In this scenario, if you didn't, if you paid interest only for the first five years, then years five through fifteen, you're paying principal. And then, uh, foreseeably, after ends of fifteen years, you would be able to refinance both that first and second because you would have paid down a significant amount of principal of the two loans enough to refinance the property. That's that's the okay. thought, the concept, and the thought process. OK. You know, one of the things I missed was the fact that because the loan is capped at 50000 this is typically going to be a second. Correct. So the, it's just kind of an assistance. It's not a loan that would be used solely to purchase a house. It, 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 these function like a down payment assistance program. Okay, but is, but is that a really good deal? I mean, when you consider, when you consider that most people today seem to be paying somewhere between two and four thousand dollars in a monthly payment, which just strikes me as absolutely appalling. <laughs> um, I, and I still don't know how people figure that out and and come up with that amount of money. So. If you've got, I mean, suppose you buy a house for 450 and only 50, and so you've got 50%, 50 percent, 50 fifty thousand, and you borrow, and you so you've still got a loan somewhere out there for 4,000, and you're, you've, you've got this enormous mortgage payment. How do you make two mortgage payments? How does anybody ever afford that? Well, I, I think the point of this program. Um, in doing it, one is, and I, I think 50 is a little light as far as the the limit of the loan. I would think more about 80,000. And the reason is, is that if you took a standard FHA loan and you put 3.5% down, which is all you have to do now, you end up paying a whole bunch of what's called PMI or payment, payment mortgage insurance right. that's not tax deductible, although if Congress gets their way, most of our interest won't be tax deductible. Um, but if we were able to give them, give an employee a loan, and instead of and say, here, you, I, I believe FHA or, or even the conforming ones, you still got to put 1% of your own money or 2%. Is that where you're getting the 18%? Is that you got to put a couple percent in of your own money? The 18% actually was just a common number we found amongst okay. most agencies. So I, most programs that my day job that we work with, I believe you have to put 1% or 1.5% of your own money into a loan for any of the programs. But then you would get this loan at, you're saying 3%. Um, I think that's a really 
really great rate um, because, again, you might get 25 or 3% for an FHA right now, but actually a little bit more than that. Um, but then you also have to pay that insurance on top of it. So we could save employees hundreds of dollars a month by having this type of a loan. My suggestion would actually be that it would be payment deferred for five years, then interest only for five years, then start making principal payments. Um, <laughs> And again, that what you're. strikes me as very bad what you're, well, financial management. No, what you're allowing, but again, you're in the program, you can require what kind of first mortgage they have. So if it's a conforming, either they have a 15 or a 30 year mortgage, they're going to be paying down their principal on that money the whole time, too. And what you're allowing them to do, one is additional purchasing power within the market, and you're saving them hundreds of dollars a month that's not tax deductible payments that, they're, that they don't have to make. And the default rate on these is much lower than traditional investments we probably would do. And you just heard what we're getting in the bank right now is 1.2 or something like that. The, if we're getting three, this is almost triple what our return is, and we're investing in our own people. Okay, so probably the, the problem that I'm having is that if, if your head is in a place where you think an employee home loan program is a good idea, then you're just interested in the bullet points that, that, that are the details of the program. There may be more than one of us up here that um, needs a little more opportunity to understand the full scope of the, the program and what it, um, how it works in other jurisdictions uh, what the financial consequences of all this is, as opposed to trying to decide that in 15 or 30 minutes? I mean, to me, the value... I'm not sure I understand this at all. And I, and I, I am not going to hesitate to say that, because this is not something that I am used to and, or something that I deal with, and... Um, I just want to be sure that if we're offering something like this, it really is a carrot and doesn't turn out to have negative consequences in the long run. Kim, what's your experience in the Bay Area around this? I mean, I could speak to it, but I mean, coming from there, how prevalent was the, were these and how did they focus them? I wouldn't say they were prevalent. I, I happen to work in an agency in the Bay Area that did offer a home loan program. Uh, but I would say it was a very small percentage overall at the time that I was there that did offer such a program. Um, it was originally geared in the city I worked in to try to encourage public safety to live in the city. Many of the public safety were living far and having to come from far distances, and so that was the initial focus of that program. Especially given the Bay Area prices. Right. Yeah. So that's where I'm, my familiarity comes from, um, is from that spectrum. But I wouldn't say that overall it's a prevalent tool. Um, it's one that's available in some agencies, but not predominantly. I mean, it, to me what it does is it sets us apart from the other agencies in this region that we're competing against, including a massive state agency that has most of its employees right around here. And to say that we offer this, that you can get a better loan term, um, the biggest struggle that Californians have in becoming homeowners is the down payment. Whether it's 3.5%, I mean, a $400,000 loan, you need $80,000 to get a conforming loan. So if you're a first-time home buyer, you can just kiss that goodbye. So when we talk about competing for young professionals and other people, this is, this is the type of program that, that when, every, when all things are equal, the paycheck's the same here, the paycheck's the same here. But this... I have the opportunity to buy in Capital Village or even some of our older neighborhoods um, and afford a home today that I don't have to make a $400, um, $400 a month PMI payment on. That's, that's a huge difference. We can pay them the exact same. We're going to get our return back, but my guess is we're going to get better talent than one of So this here. is really a down payment program, down payment mm -hmm. assistance yep. program. So, um, all right, here again. Um, so what's a so what's a normal what's a normal down payment as a percentage of the total home price? Twenty percent would be the desirable because your first is always going to be that eighty percent, and then 
if we're helping folks get to a 20% down payment, that helps, as I think uh, Mayor Terry mentioned, it helps having them avoid having to pay certain types of insurance and so forth if you don't have that level of down payment. And, 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 well, and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit differently, too. Those of you who might have been familiar with how an FHA mortgage used to work was when you hit that 80% to where you had 20% equity based on the value of your home, you used to, to go back to FHA and say, I now have 20% equity. I don't have to pay the PMI payment anymore. You don't get to do that anymore. You have that PMI payment for the rest of your life unless you refinance your home. And as low as interest rates are, and you just heard a banking professional say that he expected interest rates to go up, I used to be one I agree with him. Um, so the, the opportunity to refinance two or three years from now when rates are higher may be just a wash or even worse, so you're not going to refinance mm -hmm. that PMI payment. So so you're going to stay with this and just throw money at an insurance policy even though you own a, you know 50% of your home. So the point is that we're, we're assisting our employees in getting a better loan, and it's setting us apart from, it, you know, are they looking to work in Folsom, or are they looking to work in Sacramento, or the state, or us, and we're the only one with an incentive like this. Why would we not include our teachers and our, our police and those people as well? Well, there's, only, not, there's only so much capital to do it. And again, we just committed to moving 10 million of it maybe to other banks. So this would come, this would be an investment from our reserves. Okay. So there's only so much money. I think you could prove concept and we could go to Falls Cordova and other places and say, see, we did this, you should do it too. Okay. So the fire district, I know when I was at, at the school board, this was a conversation starter. And the, I know the fire district, Metro Fire has been looking at trying to start something similar to this. I don't know if the sheriffs have a program like this, but that might be a concept that we could share with them in the county if they so wanted to do it. Would there be more criteria to it? So it would be like you have to be a staffer and X, Y, Z, or it would be more how does it usually work when it, a city does it? I think it's it, it depends on the city and the church. I mean, I just left a housing forum in Lake Tahoe where somebody from the Mammoth Lake Water District told me that they do up to 400000 and up to 50% of the house. But that's a payment deferred loan. And again, that's why I would say you start with a payment deferred loan for five years and then interest only and then maybe go to principal payment because, again, we're helping them keep their costs lower so that they have more disposable income in our community too. Um, but it allows them to purchase more if they – that they so choose to. So I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first is that one of the presumptions is that this is actually a better investment for the city than LEAF. You know, that we'll get a better return on this 3%, which I'll ask you about in a second, um, than we would putting the money elsewhere. But have we factored in the cost of transactions into that? No, it, that is a cost. Uh, in, in my prior agency where we had a program, we ended up moving to a contract of our, um, relationship with a mortgage lender to help manage the program. So those are costs that are not built into that, although they weren't super significant. $50,000 at 3% is $1,500 a year, uh, you know, over 10-year period. So it's $15,000 uh, depreciated. Obviously, it'd be a little less than that. And the upfront costs of Doing that fifty thousand dollar loan could be, I'm not sure, five thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars, some some amount. It'll cost us in staff time and mm -hmm. insurance, et cetera. So let's just be sure we know what that is before we get into it. Um, second question would be interest rate. So I saw three percent sort of written. Is that a hard recommendation or what, what was the idea there? No, nothing here is a hard recommendation. What What is here before you is really just something to look at and react to. It was based on what we saw um, was most common in the other agencies mm. that had programs. These are not necessarily, these are not staff recommendations. It's really just give us some feedback on right. what does this sound like and how does this feel? How high has our life rate gone in the past I, 20 years? You know, I think at in circa 2005, it was actually around 5.5%. Oh, my gosh. It well, was, we really don't want to go back to those days. <laughs> but that's interesting. I didn't think it was Which historically in the last 30 years is low. Wow. Um, go back to some of the things when people were paying in 16% interest on, right. the, on a mortgage to get a house. In the, in you, the early 80s. You know, lived in the house and didn't do anything else. <laughs> yeah. And then the uh, the fifty thousand dollar cap, I think Bob. we might need to consider um, if we're trying to get over twenty percent down. 
I'm not sure 50,000 gets you to 20% down almost anywhere in Rancho Cordova. So it might need to be double that or something. Or do it, well, it's harder to control costs, but do it on a percentage. Well, 18, I, 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 to, to uh, Kim's point, I think 18% to a cap. And whether that's, to me, 400 grand, a $400,000 mortgage, you need 80,000. So you would need, you know, 2% less than that. So you, yeah, you'd need 72 grand. Mm -hmm. um, so somewhere around that number, I think, is what makes the difference. And you just, you get a better loan. You don't end up having to get an FHA or some of the other things. Okay, but if this, if this is really down, if this is really going to function as down payment assistance, then it should probably be called that. And if the standard down payment is 20%, why not do 20% of the purchase price? I, I don't know if there's a, a standard to that. Some, some down payment assistance loans cover just closing costs. They don't help you buy down the loan like I'm suggesting. That's what I'm suggesting in this case, that if our goal is to help employees get conforming loans that are backed by Fannie and Freddie and they, they're not going to get the three and a half percent that comes with insurance, and that would be twenty percent. But I would say that there, most lenders, I believe, and maybe we staff can look into this more. I believe most of them, even with down payment assistance, you have to come in with a certain amount of your own funds, and that's one or two percent, somewhere in there. But maybe, maybe we, we can, can research certainly that look and into it out. that if the council wants us to per further pursue this. Mm -hmm. And then, David, the, the only other thing, if we deferred the payment, so again, the interest accrues during the time that they're not paying the payment. So like, let's say, I'm saying the first five years we would defer payment, which means they make no payments on this loan in the first five years. That significantly reduces the servicing costs of carrying that loan. If we don't also have to take the payment, deposit it, and do all of that, you're cutting down the cost and staff time in in taking payments and put and you know answering the phone with you know for a payoff and all that kind of stuff. So is that one of the reasons that those loans, uh, deferred payment loans, were so popular during the recession? Because it it's it it traditionally it was deferred to payment manage? loans. If they're not something like this, where it's an employer sponsored housing program, like what that's what this is essentially. Any other payment deferred programs are going to be some sort of government program, and it's for low-income people to help them buy homes. So it's going to be Home Fund, CDBG, Cal Home, something like that. Those those weren't drivers of foreclosures. I think the things you're talking about are like pick-a-pay loans, which was like the Wachovia loan or Golden. I don't know. Yeah, the, the ones where you had like negative the, the the negative amortization loans where your normal interest payment was two grand, but you were allowed to pay twelve hundred. And then the rest of the interest went on to the mortgage. Those weren't down payment assistance programs. Those were just really bad loans that I worked for a company that bought three hundred billion of them or two hundred million of them or something like that, um, and had to put up on them. But those those weren't payment deferred loans. Well, that's the around we're talking about two thousand five, two thousand six, two thousand seven. You had some really hard loans that were bad loans that were done. People were paying interest only, and then all of a sudden that two or three years that they were doing, and then all of a sudden they have to make a huge increase in their payments and everything else, and they walked out of the house. You know? So, so that's, that's, again, where, from the staff's perspective, in it, most of this, as far as risk assessing it, comes to what kind of first mortgage they're getting. So if you say you've got to have a fixed rate 30-year or 15-year mortgage that's fully amortizing from the beginning for the first mortgage means in 10 years or 15 years, they've paid down every month to their mortgage. So we, would, we wouldn't allow an employee to go and get an interest-only mortgage for 10 years, which I don't really think you can get anymore. But we can require that as the second lender to say, to qualify for this program, you have to get this kind of loan, which we can require. And I, I would just add, I mean, to just as another uh, thing to consider is that these, you know, we're, I don't think this is being presented as a risk-free right. uh, proposal. And I will say the agency that I referred to earlier that I worked in that had a home loan program, there was a situation in which when the market crashed, the value of that home, the employee had a personal circumstance. They had to put their house on the market at a certain point in time when the the market was at rock bottom. And the city was going to lose its entire investment in that home in that situation. 
city ended up actually buying the house to protect its investment. Fast forward 10 years later, that house is more than recovered and then some, but that is one situation in which there was that possibility of losing that investment. So I do want to make sure that's clear that there's these are not risk-free and these are, there is that possibility if a market does crash of those types of scenarios occurring. Second means second. So the, the first mortgage is paid right. off and it's right. based on the value. So there is a risk to it, but I think, Bob, to your yours and Linda's question about the shoddy lending products of the mid last decade. Um, a lot of those don't exist, but also we can require that they get the normal kinds of loans in order to qualify for this program. So they can't go out. I mean, we can, we can literally, we, we can look at the first mortgage documents to verify that it's not something that is not responsible. And then the only the, the uh, other thing I was going to say is if they move or end employment with us, and again, because to me this is also an investment, but if they they moved out of the home, let's say they bought a three-bedroom house, now they have four kids and they need more bedrooms, so they're moving somewhere else, um, I would just say you would make that amortizing um, to where they have to make a full payment but not create a balloon payment. Because you're you're almost creating a hardship, and again, it depends on the equity that's in the home, and maybe on a case by case basis. But um, to to force a balloon payment, I think, is a bit much. And I think the reason why most agencies have that type of criteria in there is because there has to be a public purpose to mm -hmm. these loans. And so, if somebody leaves the city or the jurisdiction, seizes employment in the jurisdiction, then that public purpose has a you know, more difficult time yeah. with that. Yeah, I mean, and again, that's why that's. If we tiered it with five-year payment deferred, five-year interest only, if at any point during that time they moved, then they wouldn't continue to, to receive that benefit. They'd have to start paying it back at a fully amortizing rate. That would be my my suggestion. I don't know if that – if council has a, a different opinion. No, I mean, there's a lot of deference, as you guys have probably heard before, in terms of what what is a public purpose. You know, private individuals are allowed to benefit, but if somebody – if the whole purpose is to attract and keep talent here for a certain amount of time, um, we just have to make sure we have strong findings in the, the program that's approved and that it, you know, is reasonable. Basically, it just has to be a reasonable basis. So if, if within five years an employee quits and no longer lives here, it probably wouldn't be seen as reasonable to just let them off the hook. <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> and yeah. I don't think that's what yeah, any of you are saying. They have saying. to start making a full payment. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that those, you know, all of this input would go into sort of, I'm assuming, some draft concepts that would come back to all of you later to look at. And we would, we didn't spend a ton of time looking at all this because we wanted to wait until we got more feedback from council. So we would do a little more mm -hmm. due diligence to make sure it met all those minimum requirements. And I know we've talked a lot about the, the one thing I would just point out is with home values going the way they're going in California, that we're the first city in this region to be discussing this kind of a program. We're not the first one in California. And a whole if home prices continue to do what they're doing in California, this is going to be, in my opinion, a normal practice for all government officials. Um, and it, like I said, I was up in Lake Tahoe a couple weeks ago, and the private businesses are talking about doing these types of programs just to get executives to run – ski resorts and to get people to work at casinos and a lot of other things because they can't live anywhere where they work. And we're going to continue to see that. And I think if we got out in front of this, I could see a lot of cities following suit in the next in the next few years. But we could probably pick up some pretty decent talent. And I know we have some openings coming up pretty soon. And I, and I also, Cyrus, I don't know if you want to share, but I think even since we suggested that this was going to be a, a topic of discussion, that you've we, we've had internal employees start asking about how this was going to work and, and that there is some interest. Yeah, I've been, I've been approached by two employees uh, expressing interest. I think you're right about bringing some talent, um, by having that kind of a uh, something set up by the city. And I, I like the idea of, of uh, that. I know there are a lot of people in uh, any part of the state of California who are looking for a better way of uh, getting a house and making a, an affordable payment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I, and I think the most straightforward discussion, and four of us were in the room when we were looking at hiring a city manager, was our former city manager reminded us that, you know, you could make a loan 
I think we even talked to a candidate that had a loan from a city for their entire mortgage. And it's a better return than than your normal investment. And it's a heck of an incentive comparatively to, to someone who doesn't have that. So with that, do we need a motion? Or? Mayor Terry, we have a speaker card. Oh, great. Go ahead. Daryl, Daryl Langwell. Thank you. You're welcome. You looking for a job? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, council members, I'm totally opposed to this concept. There was a working session special meeting about two and a half, three years ago where this was discussed. Uh, four or five different cities were uh, talked about. One city did lose money on this type of a program. Uh, this is the city of Rancho Cordova, not the bank of Rancho Cordova. Uh, you're risking taxpayer money. If somebody decides after three or four years, hey, I've got a better offer somewhere else, and you try and collect, and they say, man, I don't work there anymore, I don't live there anymore, come and get it, you run into uh, legal uh, uh, expenses and that sort of thing. I just think there are much better ways to spend my taxpayer money. And everybody have a pleasant Thanksgiving. <laughs> Maybe one thing we should, we should talk about, too, is that we do place a lien up for our funds against the home. So just because they quit and move and go somewhere else doesn't mean that they don't have to pay us back. The only issue that we would run into is if the home value went down quickly and there was no equity in the home. Okay, so that breaks up another question in my mind. If somebody has, in essence, defaulted, and the city places a lien on that property, then that becomes a cloud on the title. We would place the and lien when we initiate the mortgage or the loan, not when they default. It would be recorded as a second right. to the first mortgage. Okay, so what do you do with a piece of property? <laughs> what do you do with a piece of property where... Um, Somebody, somebody really has walked off and left it, and the debt is kind of, um, and it becomes a bad debt. What happens to the property? What happens to the debt? Collect it. I mean, How do you collect blood from a turnip? I, I think those are the, it's secure. The notion is it's secured, but I think going into that level of detail is something that we would need to further explore if the council is interested in us pursuing this further. Like um, Kate mentioned earlier, we really just took council's direction at the last meeting to put some Ooh. ideas together to see if council was interested in pursuing this further. But those are definitely things that we would pursue if directed to further pursue this. And and the question of risk, you know, we've made loans to small businesses in this region, we've lot, we've taken some losses. That doesn't mean we wouldn't do it in the future. One, and we've only made a few. So again, there is a risk to any type of loan or investment that you do. Whether or not you place it in a bank that's got insurance, they're only insured to 250,000, right? Then they may have some assets, but there's a risk to anywhere that you put your money. To me, making an investment in our employees, I think is a great investment, especially if we get more productive and better talent. That's that's that that's a risk I'm willing to take. So with that, this is just a information only. Do you? Well, I think it's important that we leave with clear direction from the council. Is this a concept that the council wishes for us to pursue and bring some um, fine proposal to you? From my perspective, if we want to keep on discussing it, that's fine, but we really need a lot more information. I, I agree that I agree it is a laudable notion. I'm not sure I like the implication that we get better talent than we have now because we think we have some very talented people. But, um, uh, but if it's a marketing tool to get people to come to work here, then we really might need to know that. But I, I just suspect we need a lot more information. Well, I like what um, Donald said about the investing in the uh, employee. So 
Okay. Dave? I'd want to hear more about it, but uh, I think it's worth pursuing. Um, I'm particularly interested in sort of the return or safety aspects of it. Garrett? Okay. Can I ask a quick question Can, uh, for Kim and for Cyrus? Do you think, Kim, since you oversee our HR department, um, would you see this as a recruiting tool? I think it certainly could be to somebody who's coming potentially from another area. You know, many times when people are already established in an area and they have kids in schools and so forth, they're not necessarily willing to up and relocate. So I think it just depends on the type of person and where they are in their Point. But it would be attractive to some people. Correct. Right. Okay. I think my my take on this is this is definitely an incentive program that uh, may may work, but it's not. I'm not going to view this or present this as a risk free mm -hmm. or be an an investment that would make money for the city. That would not be the objective of the program. This would definitely. But this is basically a recruitment and retention incentive. Do you have a, would also help you have what you need? It would also help the employees who are already here, mm -hmm. possibly. If you have two people that are showing some interest in that, if we would go forward with this, at least to look into it. So I think that, um, as well as recruiting, it would also be uh, helping possibly the people here. So, you know. Okay, so we will further pursue this with the city attorney's office and return at a future meeting date with some more information. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And so with that, we're done with our regular calendar items, and we'll move on to council requests for future agenda items. We had a whole bunch last time. Any more? Okay. We covered two of them today, so that's good. Um, and so with that, we will stand adjourned.